one. Good evening, Yorktown, and welcome to the town board meeting for May 25th, 2021. If you could all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United, United States, States of America, of America. America. and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, which stands one nation under God, under God indivisible, 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 with liberty, liberty and, and justice for all. We sound like kids in school. Oh. <laughs> They're more in sync than we are. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true. Isn't that a scene from Animal House when they're all doing the play? Yep. <laughs> they may be in, more in sync, but they listen to in sync. Oh. Oh, Tommy. I'm fire to that. <laughs> before we begin, before we begin, if we could just take a moment. Uh, it's been a, a, a very sad couple of days here for the town of Yorktown and our workforce. Uh, last week, Scott Gross passed away uh, after a very courageous battle of cancer. And just yesterday, we received the tragic news that Sal Rivera of our Senior Nutrition Center lost his battle with COVID. Oh, really sad. Very sad. Terribly sad. Sal was a member of our staff for 19 years, mm. longtime member and an employee of the town of Yorktown. And Scott was a member of the Parks Department for the past three, mm -hmm. but was a resident of the town of Yorktown, graduate of, the York, of Yorktown High School. And so I ask if we can just bow our heads in a moment of silence to remember Scott and Sal and say a pr special prayer for their families during this difficult time. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. We do have a few additional announcements to share uh, just on the COVID side uh, of where we are as a community. Uh, we had one new active case reported by the Department of Health today. Yes. That's, I'm, I'm waiting for that shutout day. It's coming. I can feel it. Uh, and we still, at this point, uh, our active caseload is down, I believe, to 26 active cases in the town of Yorktown. So we've held steady or we've continued to decrease uh, over the last uh, number of weeks. So we continue to make that positive progress. Uh, yesterday, the governor announced that uh, there will be a pop-up clinic at FDR Park, uh, a pop-up vaccine clinic. Uh, they will have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, and that will be uh, Saturday the 29th through the 31st. So all weekend, for anyone looking for a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, please, it's right here in our backyard, uh, uh, courtesy of New York State. Uh, in addition, uh, for those who do receive a vaccine this week, uh, you can get a two-day pass for the state parks, again, courtesy of New York State. Uh, and that uh, pass is good for the entire summer. So uh, just another incentive being offered by the state of New York to encourage people uh, to continue to seek those vaccination shots as we continue to forge forward towards a normal, hopefully a very normal summer. Uh, here at Town Hall for the last month, uh, our doors have been open to the public from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, beginning on, uh, excuse me, Tuesday, June 2nd, we will extend those hours and we will allow the public uh, to come to ta access Town Hall from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. All visitors, however, will be required to wear a mask. So that's another very positive step forward, looking forward to seeing people here back at Town Hall and, and hearing how everyone is doing. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda today, so we can begin, unless there's anything else at the board, any members of the board wanna? Oh, if I could just a uh, just couple real quick things. Um, to anybody that didn't hear what we had to say about the uh, the Shrub Oak area um, and the Jefferson Valley area last week, it's in our radar, folks. We're working on the uh, inner city tire. Um, we're also working on cleaning up East Main Street in Jefferson Valley. Um, it's in the works. I just don't want you to think that, that your calls and your concerns go unnoticed. Um, and I'm going to try possibly for our next 
agenda or the one after to have Phil Marino, our uh, refuse, and, uh, refuse and recycle guru, um, uh, come in and give folks the lay of the land when it comes to putting out your stuff for bulk trash. Because yeah. we get numerous calls about stuff being put out too early, too much, et cetera, et cetera. There was a place over here right on East Main Street in Shrub Oak once again right. that I got calls about that had probably a 20-yard dumpster load full of stuff, and there was no special pickup call for. So, you know, those are things that I do check on when I get the reports to see, you know, maybe somebody did call for a special pickup, and that is fine, but then it goes by the yard, if I'm not mistaken. But we'll let Phil speak to that. But, folks, your concerns and your, 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 your suggestions – and comments are taken, and we try to do our best to get them taken care of. And we are with the Intercity Tire. That's right. Stay tuned. The other thing, Councilman, if you could, uh, Councilman Diana, if you could, yes. I, okay. yeah, Councilman Patel, two seconds. Uh, by the way, you, you, I love your suit, gray and white shirt. We, we, we're matching for that. Uh, Councilman Diana, if you could, uh, Memorial Day, if you can remind everyone oh. of, our, of our plans for Memorial Day this week. That's my thunder, Matt. Sorry. All right. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave the I'll leave the one in town to Ed. How's that? So he doesn't feel bad. Um, we have uh, 930 a.m. Towards the rear of the Lakeland High School, the Vietnam Memorial. We're going to have a short uh, memorial service there. That was put up by the class of 1975 and Gloria Tobias, my class. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's enough, Matt. <laughs> um, uh, and then from that point, we'll be moving to a Memorial Day celebration, which is being held at, um, or Memorial Day service, which is being held at uh, the Shrub Oak Honor Roll in between the library and the Lakeland Administration Building at 10 a.m. Um, no parade or anything like that. It's just gonna be a nice solemn service. And um, from that point, we'll be moving on to, Ed, take it away. So afterwards, we'll be running back across town, and we will be uh, having a muster and small ceremony at the uh, town hall parking lot down below at our uh, where our flags are, um, Patriots thank Park. You. Yep, thank you, Alice. I was drawing a blank for a second. So Patriots Park will gather. There'll be a, a ceremony, a brief ceremony conducted by, I believe, the American Legion this year. And then about 11.15, parade will step off, heading down to Veterans Road appropriately. And uh, it will then, uh, everyone will be dismissed from the uh, end of the parade by the new flagpole. This year, there will not be any speeches uh, to avoid that gathering, but uh, we can still march and honor our, uh, our military that paid the ultimate sacrifice. Correct. Councilman Patel, you wanted to add something? Very, very quick. I had a uh, visit a joint water box and he had the entrance to the, the road for mask. Can I tell you that? Shame on those who throw it over there, you know? And uh, let me just ask you, Supervisor, what you just said is to go into the town hall is a wonderful thing. But uh, those who are not vaccine or in the park, they don't want to, that's their own choice. Right. But, uh, you know, do they have a choice to make other people sick or infected? We have never had answers from anybody like this. You know, it's a sad. And we all have a responsibility to be safe ourselves, our family, and the others. I think we should repeat it more because you hear on the television, so many people have never served a part of the uh, nation done, but then they travel around, you know. How can we help others? Yeah. Well, I think it's, as we've said before, it's, it's being respectful and being a good neighbor. Uh, that those are critical components. Obviously, you know we've continued to uh, talk about the vaccine as a critical component to returning to that sense of normalcy. Uh, we we are following the CDC and the state of the uh, the state of New York's guidelines uh, when it comes to reopening. When it comes to uh, the events that are going to be happening in town. When it comes to the operation of our buildings, um, and so all those things. Uh, I think add up to trying to be as responsible as we can and and make sure that, and as you see with the numbers, as numbers continue to come down um, at a very, very good rate, 
And so by staying focused on that, staying focused on what we know works, um, I think all of those things add up to a very normal and hopefully enjoyable summer for everybody. Because the international travel may be another issue, you know, for us to worry. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Patel. Okay, well, we're gonna turn it over with, to our town clerk who's gonna be uh, letting in our, uh, our guests tonight. Uh, we're gonna begin with our first agenda item and I'm thrilled to welcome Tom Panic, uh, president and CEO of the Guiding Eyes of the Blind uh, located here in the town of Yorktown right at Granite Springs Road. And I believe we also have Kathleen Torres who's the executive director of Spark uh, joining us as well. Uh, Tom, good evening. How are you? Good, Matt. Thanks for inviting uh, us. I really appreciate it. Beautiful day today. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's great to welcome you virtually to the town to the town hall. Um, we are here to uh, discuss an item that you and I have talked about for uh, a number of months, um, and something that um, I know Kathleen and I have discussed a number of times as well. Um, and that is that is the formation of an accessibilities committee. Um, you know, I and I can tell you, and 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 I think that each board member has their own story. Um, recently, I heard from our Parks and Rec superintendent, who is helping uh, an individual attend uh, their son's baseball games on on the Route 202 fields, uh, and and this individual needed uh, additional assistance. Uh, because uh, for those who don't know, the Route 202 fields are just not ADA accessible. Uh, and I felt it just, it was just heartbreaking to hear uh, the story of this uh, individual uh, having to um, not being able to watch their son play baseball. And I do it every Saturday uh, with my son, Charlie. Uh, so just knowing that we had another a fellow parent struggle just to watch their kid play a, a sport, uh, I thought was uh, just completely unacceptable. And I know um, our town clerk, Diana Quas, heard a similar story, um, which was the inspiration for the, uh, hopefully the, the new adaptive playground up at Granite Knolls. And, and uh, uh, I know each town board member has, has dealt with similar circumstances in, in, in some way or another. But Tom, you and I have had this conversation about providing um, a different pr a perspective for the town and for the town board and for our different departments when it comes to accessing our facilities or taking a look at, uh, at, at the different amenities in town to make sure that people of all abilities have the opportunity to enjoy them. Yes, Matt, and thank you for your leadership uh, to the board as well on this uh, important issue. I reflect back in you know, the early 90s when we were talking about having curb cuts available for wheelchair users. And one of the downstream benefits of that being done was not just for wheelchair users, but for people with baby strollers, yeah. tricycles, wagons. Sorry. And you know, it's, it's a lot similar to those kind of experiences where if you do something that's good for one, usually it's good for the community. So I'm, I'm grateful for the leadership on this issue uh, and happy to help in any way that I can. Exactly, Tom. And, and going back to the 202 field, we had the, um, the Easter egg hunt this year, we were able to bring it back. And I remember talking to our park superintendent, and this was separate from the incident that I was describing earlier. Uh, and we had a lot of the parents coming down the, the field, the hill, to your point, with strollers. And it was wet in the morning. And if one person took a, you know, slipped with their stroller, it, it could have been, it could have been, a, you know, it could have been a bad morning for somebody who was just trying to bring their child to a, a fun town activity. So to Tom's point, um, when we look at these different uh, amenities and, and access, it's not just for individuals um, who may have specific challenges, but it makes it accessible for everybody, for our seniors, for uh, mothers with, uh, to your point, like you said earlier, mothers with babies and strollers who are gonna be pushing around, dads with strollers, because I, I push our stroller mm -hmm. around for our little <laughs> one all the time. Um, but it, I think it's important for us to get this perspective um, and, and find ways to make things more accessible. You know, I'm so happy you're doing this. Um, years ago when I was the clerk, Westchester County was sued because they allowed some polling places, um, they just gave us a waiver. And um, one of our residents was on this uh, disability group that sued the county and we had to change what we were doing. It is so 
there are times we don't even recognize little right. things. There was a lip at the the front door of this building. And when he said that, he said, um, imagine how hard it is for someone to get a wheelchair over that lip. And I remember sitting there and at the end of the day, because I spent most of the day with him, it I was so grateful because you have to begin to think the way, you know, you want to be compassionate. So therefore, sometimes we just don't know. Right. And it's good for Pete, your new committee to be able to help us understand. I, I agree. And, and Tom, uh, for what you folks do for the sight impaired is absolutely wonderful. I've had the honor of puppy raising and puppy socialization, which uh, no kids had it better than mine. When <laughs> I think we had, we had seven puppies in a month, you know, so it was like there are eight puppies in a month. I had, I had kids in my house that I never knew. Uh, but, 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 but it was a wonderful thing. Uh, but my, my point is, is that while we were raising Nacho, that was the name of my yellow lab that I had, um, we got to a point in our training where we actually went on a course blindfolded. Um, and to put your, your safety, your, ah, your mind, just to try to wrap it around this four-legged creature <laughs> that's leading you around oh, yeah. with, with no vision is, is, is really something that not everybody should have to try, but if it, it, it's just something that's, that's unbelievable um, that these, these dogs can do it. But to the point of the accessibility, you know, got to realize that, that these, th there's curbs, you need curb cuts, you need ramps, you mm -hmm. need things like that. And people that are involved in this know that. And, and thank you both so much for stepping up to the plate to, to take on this challenge. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's, you always want to help somebody, whether they're wheelchair bound crutches, mm -hmm. uh, sight impaired or whatever the case may be. And if you go to do that, always just ask, may I help you? Because maybe yeah. they don't yeah. want your help. You know, they might be very independent, <laughs> want to do it all on their own. You know, and, and, and you have to respect that. But if we can make it a little bit easier for them that want to do it on their own, let's do it. Right. And I, I just want to point out that Kathleen uh, Torres from, uh, from Spark is here as well. Uh, another Yorktown organization. Uh, Kathleen, it's great to see you tonight. Nice to see you too. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so um, honored to be part of this uh, committee. I think yeah, we're going to we're... Do, we're work really well together. <laughs> We're definitely excited about it. Uh, I just want to go back to Tom real quick. Tom, while we have you, do you want to just talk about some of the exciting things going on for Guide, at Guiding Eyes right now? And Kathleen, I'll come over to you and you, and you can talk about Spark just briefly. Yeah, no, first let me thank you for volunteering to, uh, with those puppies. It's uh, an organization that relies on the community oh my uh, volunteers to really do our mission. And I'm, I'm a visually impaired blind person myself at my Pete here is my yellow lab named Blaze. He's a friendly, happy yellow lab. And uh, at one point, a volunteer just like you, you know, helped him as a puppy become what he is for me. Yeah. Uh, Getting Eyes to the Blind has got a lot of exciting things going on. I'm really uh, pleased to be um, getting more involved with the community. I think it's something that uh, we could do a better job at. And uh, not only for volunteerism, but also just to be part uh, and supporting the community. We have over 1,500 volunteers in the area. And uh, recently, we uh, took um, a lease on the 1961 Commerce Street location, which is being converted into a community outreach center right in the, uh, the heart of Yorktown Heights there. So I'm excited about that. I visited the uh, building today. We also have a carriage house, which uh, we have as a pickup and drop-off center that uh, Matt uh, had an opportunity with Jenna to tour uh, during the during the recent months to uh, to have a place on site where community volunteers can pick up and drop off the dogs uh, yeah. as uh, as they volunteer. So that's also a wonderful thing. So just really happy to be part of the community, uh, be part of the the town, and part of the fabric of the the people that volunteer. So those are uh, wonderful things that we're looking forward to to doing over time. Really excited about the advisory committee. Um, you know, to your point about people being independent, it is true. 
but uh, but at the same time, you know, I've I've been blind for almost 40 years, and you know, I've never sued anybody for anything, and I really believe in my heart that people can work things out if they talk about it. And uh, this is one of the this is one of the uh, most wonderful things about uh, you know community involvement is being able to, to talk through issues, bring them to the attention. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and see what's reasonable to do. So with that, I'll stop and uh, just uh, come from a place of, uh, of uh, gratitude. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that. Councilman Patel, you have a question for Mr. Patel? Yes, uh, really, you know, this is a world-renowned, uh, you know, uh, place where people would like to have it more. We don't have it enough. It's a generosity. And I remember the way it started up a long, long time ago. People are waiting. But, you know, let me just say something. You know, there was some place that, you know, there is a way, you know, they may be able to transplant cornea after somebody passed away and be able to improve the vision, really. They can see that, you know. I mean, the issue is the cost and all that, but maybe that someday nobody will be needed, you know, will you have extra additional, uh, even one eye, you know, if not at all. And it has already been, uh, you know, uh, implemented in many, many places. So this is really wonderful, you know. And then don't forget the, all the armed forces, you know. They are a soldier right. too, you know. Right. They are a real soldier to the soldier, you know. Yeah, I, I remember the myth was, you know, moving in the, with the, one of the thing in a, in a training in a helicopter in a light, you know. It's just a <laughs> extra, extra, extra demand, and it's a wonderful thing. And we all should be so always helping this situation like this. Thank you. You Thank know, when you. I joined Rotary um, and sat on the board. We used to have our meetings at Guiding Eyes at night, um, and we got to learn a lot about it um, because there are so many things that you may not that you that I didn't know. Um, their graduations were wonderful. Um, I'm just delighted that we're doing this with with Guiding Eyes and Spark. <laughs> you know, Alice, you're, you're so right about the graduations. Uh, Tom, we've met before. I'm actually in the Yorktown Lions. And uh, actually, so is Jenna now, by the way, and Matt's wife, Kelly. So one of one of the highlights, I know we used to, and I, some things have changed, and I hope we get back to it. We used to do the uh, party for a graduating class each year. And, yes. um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's beyond most people's grasp how much work actually goes into, uh, you know, trying to help accommodate people that want to be self-sufficient. So, you know, on, and on both ends, uh, you know, with, with Spark, with Guiding Eyes, uh, to be able to help, uh, you know, Tom, just, just for the, the sake of a rough number, how many hours of training does a dog go through? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, from the beginning of the birth at the puppy center, when it gets massaged by a volunteer, through the final training, we just had a new class on campus today four new people came to our town heights to receive their guide dog and they took the leash in their hand for the first time. Uh, I would say the actual physical training of teaching the dog how to do the work takes about uh, 18 weeks of nonstop full-time work, but it's really a two year process from the moment they're born to the moment the leash is handed off. And I can't even start to count. That is one of the best questions I've ever heard in my job. I'd love to have an answer for you. <laughs> Maybe I'll calculate it one day, but it's countless hours, countless hours. Mm -hmm. uh, two years from birth to, to the leash being handed off, that's, yeah. you know, that, that's an impressive amount of time. And that's, that's not even the time that the, it's another week for the class, correct? Why the dog yes. is accustomed to uh, their, their, their ward. And then, uh, and then there's, I'm sure, an adjustment period outside. I, I, I think in one of the classes I met someone who was on their third or fourth dog. Yes. And, you know, and, but just, you know, the amazing stories and, and, yeah. and you know, the lions having that tie, it, 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 you know, it, no pun intended, does open your eyes to the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, well, we, we have really benefited from the lion support as well. I know we're getting off track, but the lions have been an incredibly uh, generous organization to getting eyes to the blind. Uh, if you walk around the campus, and I have an open invitation uh, to all of you to visit, you'll see the plaques around the campus uh, commemorating the Lions' generosity uh, throughout the years. What is the new building that you're building, by the way? Uh, it's the carriage house, and essentially it's a, 
renovation uh, just off the Granite Springs Road entranceway uh, that uh, will accommodate people in the community uh, like Jenna who volunteered to bring the dogs to their home in the evening times just before they're going into class. Mm -hmm. And it's a pick up and drop off center uh, for those dogs. And are you doing puppy massage on the campus here or do you have to, is it up, up in Patterson? Uh, we, we do both. Uh, primarily the, the puppies at that age are in the Patterson location, but we do have uh, a monthly or biweekly massage for the adult dogs. And we're always looking for volunteers. We currently have 75 dogs in the kennel. Our maximum capacity is 175. With the pandemic, we've brought things down a notch. Uh, yeah, but we certainly do that. And I do, I do remember Nacho. I won't take up any more of your time, though. Really? Did you, do you really? You remember, remember old Nacho? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, you, you know, Alice spoke of, of the graduations. If anybody out there in, in, in Zoom TV land has never been to a graduation, you owe it to yourself to go. Yeah. They, uh, they have sight impaired people playing a piano. I can just about play the radio. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we know that, Tommy. Enough, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's 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 an organization that's been around here for decades. I was, of course, a police canine handler, and Guiding Eye Guiding Eyes was always more than gracious to us, um, bringing the dogs in, vaccinating them, you know, using the veterinary uh, uh, veterinarian. Um, and w if there's ever an open house up at the up at the puppy uh, center. You owe it to yourself to go to that too, because you'll mm -hmm. never see so many puppies in one place at <laughs> one time. My, I just my, want to just want to take them all home, you know. My, my friends Mark and Donna, I think, may have been caught a couple of times trying to smuggle something out. <laughs> <laughs> they they actually are just shocked that it's volunteer and you don't have to pay to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, you know what I, I didn't realize before I, we morning we took me there was that people come from all over yeah. to get these, yeah. these dogs. It's not yeah. from Yorktown, necessarily from Yorktown. I um, think I met someone from Alaska one time. That right? So, and, I, and I know some people that were international also. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Nacho had gone out to California. Uh, La Cunha, California, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, he actually, his, his sight impaired uh, uh gal was uh was in college and he let her out of a smoke filled building. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. Real quick, I just want to go over to Kathleen uh, to talk about Spark, another great organization here in Yorktown. Kathleen, why don't you give us a quick update on on what's going on over at Spark these days? Thanks everyone for having me again. Um we're doing exciting things at Spark. We're actually um now running all of our in-person programming. Um, so we're really excited about that. We have um, programs going on, team time program going on in Yorktown Heights in our office. We have programs going on all over Westchester uh, golf. We're right now um, starting up our golf program at Moh uh, Mohansic. So um, film, we're doing film again. So we have a lot of our great programs that are starting up in person. Kathleen, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but in case sure. people don't know what Spark is, you want to tell them what you guys do? SPARC is an organization that provides development services to developmental disabilities from all ages, from childhood, teens, and young adults. And we're right in Yorktown Heights. We've been around now for 32 years. Yep. Um, all of our programs are based on um, the, the, the fact that our individuals come to us to learn, to laugh, to live. Part of it is recreational therapy, um, as well as socialization and helping improve their communication skills. So more recently, we're really focused on the individual actually excelling um, to their future. So learning a lot of daily living skills, work skills, and skills that they can communicate in, in the community itself. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. Uh, we're all over Westchester. Um, so I'm so glad to be here and part of this uh, accessibility committee because we do have individuals who are in wheelchairs, who have a hard time walking, and I, I, I'm, you know, honored to be representing them as a, as their advocate, um, as well as advocates here for people who are living in Yorktown and who use York, Yorktown facilities. Mm -hmm. So this is wonderful. 
Um, what we're doing now and something that's try we're trying to, to work with um, actually Matt Slater is that we're trying to maybe have a day where our individuals can participate and have a town day that showing around how um, things work at the town level, about town council, about the town supervisor. Uh, it's just a way of people learning more things and maybe having an internship program established. Um, so uh, we're, we're just trying to create different things, things that will help them for their future, uh, okay. as well as uh, trying to uh, develop some new workforce environment for them as well. So those are exciting things that are happening at you Spark. Have that program would be a town supervisor, be a town clerk for a day. And <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Councilman Patel, you have a question? Yes. Uh, you know, this program is, do we have a other town we work together with them? Because there was some issue one time for the funding and all that, you know? So do they work uh, Yorktown with the nearby neighbor, you know, and then how many people from one town like that? Because it's wonderful, you know, that we stick together and uh, help each other because everybody needs, you may never know that you may need that shoulder to lean on, you know? Yeah. I'm not sure, um, is the question in regards to uh, working with other towns? No, think, other think, town, you know, we are like, a, you know, Yorktown, maybe the Cortland, the Pitsky, like mm -hmm. that, you know, Austin, there was some collaboration of activities. You know? yeah, I, some town. Councilman, I think that was, um, that's Norwest. Yeah, Norwest. That's, oh, that's okay. That's what you're referring to. Another, another great organization that does a lot for our community. Right, right. Uh, Kathleen, I, I just wanted, you know, just to just to let people know, I remember uh, probably three, no, it might be more, it might be like four or five years ago, you recognized, Spark recognized the town of Yorktown. And I had the pleasure of going, you did a, a, a little uh, dinner and award ceremony and auction down at uh, Captain Lawrence. And, um, you know, I, I just wanted, I think I want to share the impression that there was a young man who was also being honored and I can't remember his name for the life of me right now but to hear his parents talk about the structure the guidance the the family that he had at Spark and, and to see the impact and to hear about that was just absolutely amazing uh, I've, I've worked with uh, developmentally disabled uh, young adults and it's uh, it's not an easy chore to, to gain trust and build that community and build that family feeling. But, you know, the, 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 the feeling that I got after listening to uh, specifically his mom was talking about it was just- I think it might've been Ryan, Ryan Morris. Yes. And his mom is Sue Morris and Andy Morris. Yes, yes. Yeah. So just hearing them, it, it made a huge impact on the work that Spark does. So, you know, yes. thank you. Why yes, we do. Know? I mean, we do amazing things. And like you said, um, it, it's more of a family feel. Um, we, for example, um, this weekend, one of our participants, she graduated from high school, from, I'm sorry, from college. She, she went to Manhattanville College. Okay. And she had been with us since she was 15 years old, participating in all of our programs. But I think a lot has to do with Spark helping her throughout the way, helping her build to communication skills, as well as socialization skills. And that's part of the reason why I think she was able to get through college. Um, but it was amazing because we were part, we were kind of part of her, her life and continue on. So, so yeah, we're, we're kind of like a family at Spark. This is what makes Yorktown different from so many other communities. It, it, it's, it's the volunteerism and well, we'll say, well, we may not have something, but we'll go and try to find it for you. Um, right. I just think that, um, I want to thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, um, Guiding Eye, for just coming here and doing the work. Yeah, we're very, very excited for the committee. It'll be a great benefit to this town. Uh, we're looking forward to its formation. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, of course, assisting the town board and our departments uh, in making sure that all of our facilities are accessible to people of all abilities. So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Kathleen, for your time. We really do appreciate it. Matt and uh, to the whole council, thank you for your leadership on this issue. It's our, our pleasure to serve. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you both. Appreciate Likewise, it. Likewise, I feel honored. Thank you so much. Have Thanks. a good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you guys. Night. Appreciate it. Appreciate all you do. Yeah. Just great people. Great people. Great.
organizations. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, there when we when we talk about the town of York Town, you have to say people here have a heart. Yep. Yep. Um, that's what I think. Yeah. What I saw here in 1985 when I moved here, and it what it's what's kept me here. Yeah, it's great. Well, we're going to move on to um, our next item on the agenda, which is the Veterans Advisory Council. Okay. Councilman uh, Ed Lachterman is our liaison to the Veterans Advisory Council, and we're joined tonight by Carl Libertor and Mike Sheridan. Um, Carl, there's Carl. Excuse me, Matt. How are you? Diliberto. Diliberto. Oh, I'm sorry. It was it was written. Uh, yes. Our apologies for that. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Ed, Ed already apologized. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be court-martialed court for that one. <laughs> you know it. Should be. <laughs> Probably. But we all know the face, Carl. I'm sorry? We all know your face, so. That's yeah. true. <laughs> uh, I, I see Mike Sheridan is trying to join uh, um, the audio again. Uh, Carl, obviously, you're a member of the American Legion. Uh, Mike uh, is a member of the, of the VFW. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Lachterman. Uh, Councilman, take it away. So uh, we, we uh, have been working with the Veterans Advisory Committee and of course at a road bump because right after we formed, we had one meeting and then uh, COVID struck. So we, we uh, managed to get back on, on track and we are uh, hoping that we see a little better participation, but Carl and, uh, and uh, Major Sheridan have been uh, uh, true leaders in, in the uh, in the, the board and we are trying to put together a mission statement so we could accurately guide our, our conversations to what we should be doing. So uh, Mike had put together a, uh, a mission statement and I think it would be appropriate for him to share it with us. And then when we're done with that, uh, you know, I want to make sure, make sure the board is happy with it. And mm -hmm. then uh, after that, I did have one other thing to bring up as well. Okay. So, Thanks, so the statement <clears throat> I wanted to focus on the two different kinds of uh, activity so the statement I wrote as a proposed mission statement is as a community that is welcoming of veterans and attentive to their needs and recommendations the Veterans Advisory Council of Yorktown shall have the mission of advising the town board and other interested parties on matters impacting the welfare of veterans and their family members and survivors. The Veterans Advisory Council shall be available to assist in connecting the veteran population with available programs at the town, county, and state level, and in providing guidance to organizations or individuals who can bring action or attention to filling the needs of the veterans of Yorktown. Excellent. I think that's wonderful. Nice, nice. So you know, in in reality, we wanted to uh, before we guide our next our next uh, meetings, bring this to the board, look for your blessing, and then uh, you know we will adopt this uh, at, at our next meeting. I think it's perfectly said. Very well done, uh, Major Sheridan. As always, great job. Uh, Excuse me, though. I think when we discussed this the other last week, we also said this was a starting. Mm -hmm. uh, correct, Mike? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So we could add to it uh, later on as things progress. Mm -hmm. right. mission, mission statements are usually living, breathing uh, documents. So they, you know, very similar to, to our Constitution. It's the interpretations and changes that could be made, and uh, we want we will definitely follow up on that as we go along. Okay, it's 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 the brief back to headquarters to say, have I captured what you folks were thinking of when you put pen to paper and said, go do this? I think it absolutely is. Um, I I just think this is great because you know very often, um, particularly elderly veterans or elderly people in general they don't know where they can go to make their complaint because you guys know everything 
this is a, this is such a blessing for this will be such a blessing for people. Yeah, I, I mean, we had, uh, remember Frank Garcia, a Yorktown resident. He yeah. He didn't. He didn't know. He didn't know where to go, and he also felt, and I think a lot of veterans feel, that the system was basically rigged against them. And yep. so, I always felt that there's no greater advocate for a veteran than a fellow veteran. Yeah, I know that. Um, and I know that you guys would run through run through walls for each other. Um, and so, I, I, I just I, I agree wholeheartedly with Alice. And I think the mission statement is spot on. That's exactly I think what we were envisioning uh, your your role to be is and and especially providing. And I like how you also in, you also brought in not just local but local county and state resources because that's critical. It really, really is uh, because you know the the count not just Yorktown but the county and the state do offer uh, a whole bunch of benefits and services to our veterans. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just understanding what's there and mm -hmm. asking for some help and not and trying to obtain them. Um, I, re I remember you know we dealt a lot with um, the veterans community when. Uh, I, I was a staffer in the legislature, both in the assembly and the Senate. And it's just a lot of times, again, just helping them overcome those obstacles, those bureaucratic obstacles. So I think it's great, guys. And I believe, um, I'm just checking real quick. Um, I believe that we now have uh, a, a, a page that Robin put up for the Veterans Advisory. And some of those uh, resources are available through there. Uh, there's, well, I see a web link for Westchester County Veterans Service Committee, and mm -hmm. we'll, get, we'll get some more things on there. It's a, it's a growing page. I'm sure uh, Carl and, 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 and Mike know, but one of the things, and this is a bit off topic of the mission statement, but one of the things I'd love for us to maybe dive a, dip, a bit deeper into is the, is the Dwyer Peer-to-Peer -peer Program. Uh, which is obviously very, very important uh, as we continue to combat veteran suicide, uh, providing that mental health service uh, to the, the men and women who've served our country. So that's a, that's a state-run program that's administered by the county, but maybe that's something that we can work with our partners on both levels uh, to get a, a more uh, a robust presence here in Yorktown. I know that uh, Putnam does, uh, Carl Rohde and Putnam does a great job with that as well. Um, uh, and the Putnam uh, Veterans Agency. But that's just another program, again, that we can try to draw more benefits from here locally. Well, I Agreed. think um, it's, it, um, we used to have a, uh, a senior office in the, uh, that, that came up maybe two days a week in the old sixth grade school. And certainly um, it won't hurt if we see whether or not we can get someone from Veterans Affairs to come and be housed in an office for a couple of hours for those people who may not have a computer or who may not have the wherewithal. Um, we'll announce when that person is going to be in count, uh, at the YCC state. Um, I think all of these things are are great because there are a lot of people who don't know what to do who, who will forego benefits. If they they're not they they're not told about them, right? Huh. Agreed. Anything so, else? Yeah, Anything you know, I, I, I wanted to uh, I did want to bring something else up. Uh, excuse me, excuse oh, me, Ed, Before you do, yes. Um, do we? Do you have to vote on this to officially adopt this, or is that that's it? That's what you do. We 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 no, would. I, I didn't know. If, you know. No, I don't think we need to pass a resolution authorizing it. I, I think that oh. you know checking with us is is uh, very uh, appreciated, and um, but I think you guys are obviously uh, exactly on the right path that we had hoped that you would take. All right. So so the feedback loop is complete. Good. Yes, sir. Gotcha. So so the other thing I'd like to bring up, especially as we're approaching Memorial Day. Uh, is I'd, I'd like the board to consider a resolution uh, going to the state expressing support of a proposal to pay tribute, honor, and remembrance to our state's atomic veterans uh, by naming uh, the pedestrian bridge across the Taconic State Parkway the Atomic Veterans Memorial Bridge. Now, now there's been a there's been a uh, bill that's already come out of committee in the assembly. 
and uh, I don't think one has entered into the state, so the, the uh, into the Senate, so the Assembly won't vote on it. Okay. So I, I'm hoping that our our support of this will help our colleagues in state government realize that it's an important situation. Uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with what an atomic veteran is. I was just going to ask you that because I'm not. So in, I think it was 2018, actually, our guest speaker at the Memorial Day uh, was a uh, atomic veteran. His name. Yes, I remember him. Yeah, um, his name is uh, Ed Gettler. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he's from Putnam, but uh, spoke at our parade. So I, I, I took the exact definition so I don't uh, mess that up. An, an atomic veteran is a veteran who was exposed to ionizing radiation while present in the site of a nuclear explosion during his or her active duty. The U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs defines an atomic veteran who, as part of his or her military service, participated in an above-ground nuclear test 1945 through 1962, or was part of the U.S. military occupation forces in and around Hiroshima and Nagasaki before 1946, or was held as a prisoner of war in or near Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, we are not the only country that, ha that recognizes uh, the uh, atomic veterans. Um, I, I think we, we have uh, service personnel from the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, France, China, and Russia who were uh, similarly exposed during their active services. And I believe it was in 95, uh, Bill Clinton uh, and, and, and the, his uh, presidency engaged in a, um, in, in a uh, hearing to find out about this. And, and, and they found that there was actually experimenting done on our troops with the radiation. And uh, it, it was a mess. There was a formal apology by the US government in, I believe, 96. Uh, in New York State, a lot of singular groups and individuals are recognized with highways or bridges named after them. Uh, matter of fact, is the bridge over the reservoir, uh, what, what group is that for, Matt? Do you know, remember? That was Farley. 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 No, no, no. That, that, that's the one by the oh. dam. There's one, the bridge over the reservoir is named the for- The American the, Veterans. That, that's AMVETS. Yeah, oh, that's AMVETS. 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 Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, oh the Taconic, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, it. northbound. Yeah. So, so the, the atomic veterans are actually the one group that, as far as my research has gone, is not recognized at all. So, you know, I, I was hoping that uh, we could have discussion if needed, and uh, if so, pass a resolution of support to send to the uh, state. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'll motion it. I mean, I don't think any discussion is really necessary for our vets. Our vets have given to us in so many ways to preserve our freedom and keep us the way we are at this point in time. That's the least we can do is name a bridge after. Well, yeah. well there, there is there is one one argument, which is a, a very good argument that, that you don't want to, and I, I think Carl brought this up in conversation before, as well as through an email, you don't necessarily want to recognize one group over another. Uh, I, I do know, though, that there are groups, the, the bridges are named after groups, and this is one, but, uh, you know, I'd like to make sure that, uh, that our representatives from the, uh, from the Legion and from the VFW are on board as well. Yeah, and before you do it, can we get whatever language they want the state is looking for? Because we want to duplicate whatever someone else has, and that way it gets flagged real quickly. I I don't know if there's actual language, but I could supply uh, Mr. Rodriguez with the uh, with the assembly bill. Yeah. Okay. If, if that would help. Yeah. And and Councilman D uh, Lachman, this is the bridge that connects uh, Legacy. I believe it's the Legacy Trails right. across the. Everyone knows that as a bridge to nowhere because it's like the bridge to nowhere. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a bridge to nowhere. It actually it actually connects right. our trailway. Uh, the legacy trails and then over to the, over to the Sylvan Glen side, right? Yeah. So, Carl, Mike, are you guys on board with this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, as I, I brought up in the email, um, you know, if you take the bridge over to Taconic, it says American veterans. 
as speaking of all veterans. This is a group, you know, then you have your other groups here and there. Mm -hmm. But I, after I read it, I understood what it was about. <coughs> I appreciate it. It just you. hit me with it tonight. I didn't listen to the speaker that time. Like I it. usually don't go to the gazebo. Yeah. The parade. yeah, he was our guy. We brought him. Yeah. Right. He was wonderful. Take um, all the crap, Mike. So I didn't, I, well, I never no, knew. Non-member, non-member, but we did hook him up and, and get him to the podium. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know anything about this till tonight, but I'm on board. Thank you. Actually, uh, a gentleman that uh, that I went on the honor flight with, Bert Houseworth, his father, his uh, brother, I'm sorry, his older brother actually worked on the crew of the Enola Gay. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Very, very and you'll, you'll get um, Adam the the bill the bill number so we can he can draft the resolution for next week. Is that suffice? That that would be great. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, thank you to to, to Carl and Mike. I'm sorry. I said good night to Carl and Mike. Oh, good night, Carl and Mike. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much for having us. Good night. Oh, thank you very much. Good, good night, gentlemen. Appreciate good it. Good night. Cheers. Uh, We'll go on to our next item, which is the Jefferson Valley Mall proposed amended site plan. I'm going to welcome Steve Harris of Washington Prime, Heather Novak, I believe Alexa O'Rourke is joining us. And we, I just saw John Tegeter on uh, quickly. Uh, uh, again, there we, we go. We got that Tegeter guy out. Yep. <laughs> He's muted. He can't say nothing. Can't get away from me, Tom. I know it. I know Not it. Tonight, I, that, anyway. <laughs> as hard as I try. <laughs> this is a discussion on a proposed outdoor patio at the Jefferson Valley Mall. Good evening, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Hey, Survivor Steve. Center, long time no you. see. Oh, it's good to see you again. Same here. Like, put the band back together. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like. That's what I like to hear. Excellent. Uh, so I, I know we have Alexa and Heather Novak, who are just always great to see and, and do great work at the mall. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been fantastic. Hello, hello. hello. So uh, so nice you. If you'd like to see if you want to start uh, just with a presentation to the board about what the proposal is. Oh, let's bang and figure out uh, how to show this. Just a moment. All right. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. So this is a not terribly uh, complicated project for you all, uh, but it takes a little bit of explaining. So allow me to walk through. Okay. First orientation. This is one of the mall entrances on the upper level. Uh, Macy's is just to the right. Here is a Peekskill Peak Brewery's uh, exterior entrance and their existing patio scenario. And this set of walls over here are existing uh, back of house walls that are for our, um, our dumpster. And what we've decided to do is move that dumpster, which we've already done. We've moved it into an existing truck dock and we propose to demolish these walls. Okay. This shows a plan on this side of what existing wall is, is today. Okay. So you can see the outdoor area where it's you know, uh, up against the wall looking back out. <clears throat> this wall and this wall define the truck dock. These two doors actually provide a trash access. Um, so we propose to remove these walls and extend um, an interior wall that's here today over to here. So get you back oriented. This wall right here is the existing wall that I was pointing at. There's those two doors we looked at. Mm -hmm. And this is the dock. It's depressed. And so this is the edge of concrete here. So we proposed to take this uh, masonry wall, the same materials, and just simply continue it all the way down to here. Okay. Once that's done this whole area would then become open and useful uh, to the tenant. Uh, this area can be expanded now. We have the outdoor seating area would be much larger now. Uh, this screen wall would be extended to continue to, to uh, screen our uh, utilities and to also define the exit. Uh, so if I can go to the next page, zoom in a little bit if you don't mind. I believe this is uh, one of the plans that you have received. So I just kind of want to walk you through, whoops. Outsmarting myself this moment. Okay, let's get back in. Okay, so here's the mall. 
and uh, the Peekskill area is right here. This is the proposed wall. Today, the wall comes out in this area. So we're gonna demolish it, install this wall. This whole area will become activated. We're proposing to put a fence around the edges of it. Uh, there's a secondary fence. This is the exit route for the mall. Uh, we have an exit that's over here that uh, to an exit staircase. This is the route. We've been working with the building department. Our architects have been doing so to make sure this is code compliant. Uh, and again, the dumpster's already been moved, uh, which is sitting here. So here's the dock, and here's another compactor for one of our other, other tenants. And it's uh, just about as simple as that. So we're here to seek your support and approval so we can execute the project and open up. And Steve, I know that, that we already referred out to uh, the necessary agencies. No, no, it wasn't, just two agencies. No oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought it was all. Oh, well, I know the Conservation Board came back um, with, with uh, no problem. And the discussion last night, John, from the Planning Board? Uh, the Planning Board had no problem and supports the project. Great. And I'll, I'll get you that memo as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, I think this has got to go out to a larger, unfortunately, because it's, you're amending the site plan, so it's going to have to go out to a larger, um, a larger group. But I think this is, this is what people, this is the way people want to live now. Right. So, I think it's a, it's a great project for the mall. I do too, for, yeah. for Peekskill Brewery and the mall. Um, if there was anything that COVID was good for, it was to allow people to understand it's kind of nice sitting outside eating. Precisely. In fact, um, these types of scenarios right by our, our, our entrances are uh, very important throughout our moral portfolio. It's mm -hmm. increased activity, a lot of energy. Uh, to your point, mm -hmm. that's exactly what happens here. It is preferred. People like doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, is this going to be, uh, you know, year-round use or only just uh, summer? Uh, and well, it'll be available year-round, but I think it'd be rather cold during the winter. So it, it's going to be a seasonal <laughs> scenario. Great. Steve, is that dumpster, or not dumpster, I'm sorry, that loading dock going to remain, correct? That's correct. The loading yep, dock, yep. Yeah, we'll go okay. back here, um, plan it up, um, zoom a little bit. The dock is right here. So I was, the picture we were looking at, the dock remains, this falls along the edge, again, it's compressed, mm -hmm. so it drops down, you can see the staircase down to it. Yep. So it remains unaffected. Okay. You just simply move the trash compactor to a new location. Okay. I, I have no problem with it. Do you want to um, agree to refer it out to the appropriate agencies? Yeah, I think we should refer it out as quickly as we can. So this way we can I agree. bring it back as quickly as we can. And it seems like there's no objections from the board. Mm -hmm. to work. Let them get working. Want. Right. So if we can expedite this and get it through the process i think that's Motion. i think it's a, it's a layup for us to be honest with you yeah second, Motion. second. Motion. 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 trying to get into the uh construction on this do they have a guide the timeline that they said they wanted to try to get it uh, done by steve do you know when you're planning on hoping to, to start this yeah our our, uh, our tenant is interested in opening this up a uh, lot of part of summer which is uh, pretty aggressive um it kind of uh supports the idea of getting a permit in the next uh, 30 to 45 days. I just don't know how realistic that is if it's being referred out. Uh, I'm not sure what the agency would need from us or if these are public hearings or whatnot. Yeah, no, it requires a public hearing um, since it's an amended site plan. But at the same time, like I said, we can, we can, um, we've got a motion in a second to refer it out. Uh, and then we can work with our clerk. Uh, Diane, I don't know if you can look at the calendar to see what the soonest, earliest date we can get a public hearing on for it. Uh, June's gonna be uh, kind of tough because we have the primary election. So, I, you know, I'm gonna probably say July 6th. That, that worked in your timeline, Steve. Uh, yeah, we'll make it work. So we can have all our referrals back in by that point in time. Yeah. Um, and July 6th, we get the public hearing. And July 7th, hopefully you guys can put a hammer to the ground. Yeah, I, I can't see that there is any kind of issue here. Um, no. 
and I'm uncertain about the status of the building permit. My guess is, uh, my, I guess my hope would be that we could um, resolve all building permit issues pending the approval. So if we were approved on, on the 6th, we could draw the permit on the 7th. Well, he's got a, he'll get a referral, so he should be able to um, address that. Okay. Very yeah. good. And, and and you may need a like I'm sure your your crews know this. You may need a demo permit for that one wall. Um, I'm not sure, but just just so you don't get hung up. Yeah, well, make sure that they're they're clear on what they're supposed to do. I know the architects have been working very closely with the city on, on these. Okay, matters. great, great. We're the ladies. We want to hear what's happening at the mall. Oh, we're here. So. Um, now that we think that we're we're having some great progress to getting this beer garden constructed, in impromptu, uh, starting next Friday night, offering to the entire community, we're going to be rolling out tunes and brews every Friday night, free to the community, outdoors, in a, a, a pop-up beer garden that we have now that we're trying to make as aesthetically pleasing as possible in the interim. Um, we're super excited. I mean, listen, the last year of COVID was a COVID year. We don't need to kind of recap that for everybody on this call. We all lived it together, but um, we really feel very confident and comfortable where we are over at the Valley, AKA Jefferson Valley. Um, we feel as though, listen, we are born to connect our community together and we have a perfect center and a perfect location to do that. Over the last couple of months in the, in the height of COVID, we opened up five businesses. So these are our neighbors. These are our friends. These are our local business owners that we're here to support, you know, one another from the aspect of the community. Um, another thing that we're rolling out the entire summer is summer sweat series. So we have free summer programming to all community members, w whether it be yoga, aerobics classes, there's something that's happening every single day. Um, we were featured on NBC New York City a couple of weeks ago, which is a huge success for us. Um, seeing that we are definitely a catalyst in change making the shopping center industry. Um, that was huge for us to be featured in that piece. And again, it just showcases local business owners, our friends, people that our, our children go to school with, their parents. Um, you know, these are, these are our community members' first jobs as 16 year olds, their first dates here at the center. So I empower our community and I empower our town to tap in and say, hey, what can I do? Um, to ensure that Jefferson Valley, the Valley will be a continued success. I mean, we have Peaksfield Brewery that just opened up. They're going to be rolling out karaoke nights and fun nights to do with friends, date nights. I mean, I know that we're all kind of cooped up and ready to, to break out. And um, there's going to be something happening every single day, multiple times a day over at the Valley. Please follow us at um, Jefferson Valley um, on Instagram and on Facebook for all most updated events. But Stay tuned. I mean, we've we've opened up women's boutiques over the last couple of months. Um, we've added a whole bunch of mural work, graffiti artists. We're we're partnering with visionaries because we believe that there is an energy there, um, and we're 100% committed to um, ensuring that the property is successful and that the community feels that that's a place that they're welcome. You know, one happy to have are, open. Go ahead. One of the things that I never thought you did well was get your message out to the community. And I don't only mean Yorktown, Yorktown is large, but you, you're, you're there you go to um, Somers, to Putnam. Um, you've got a very large community. And I think that a lot of people would just like to hear what you just said, because a lot of these things, I don't think many people know about. And um, when I came up here, I, my daughter was young and in fact, Matt and I talked about our kids going to the, the Friday night movies. Um, so I think people need to rehear that you are, I guess you're really new. Cause I remember when I came here with Landon Gilbert and I got shown around. I just think it's very exciting over there. Well, thank you so much for your support. That truly matters. Any positivity, I mean, words have so much weight and so much value. So when we're in and around town, remembering and speaking about it in a positive light and how we're all active change makers and we all have a part to play in everything that we're, do everything that we're revitalizing in every part of life. So um, anywhere that we could speak, anywhere that we could broadcast our message, we would love to do that. I don't know, 
you know, obviously you guys are, you have a lot going on on your agenda tonight, but I don't know if we can break away. I'm happy to do an open forum question and answer with the community that, that does, I get fueled up by that. <laughs> I don't shy away from that. Um, I'm ready to hear what the community members have to say. I think I have heard that throughout the years, but I want it to be more of a two-way type of communication so they understand where we're coming at from, so they understand what we're working on behind the scenes, but also how they could help their mission and how they could help change the story about Jefferson Valley that's been in their lives for so, so many years. I mean, just because that the, the retail and the mall industry might be changing a little bit doesn't mean that you know, we all can't have a chance in, in, in being a part of history. So, you know, that's what I'll leave on for tonight. Continue checking us out on all of our social media platforms. We have an amazing marketing team that, you know, uh, actively posts everything that's happening and supporting our, our tenants and, and their offerings through those platforms. Um, but let's definitely do it. I'm ready to do a whole town address. And I don't know if we can do it in person, but I'm ready to do that too. So just let me know the next uh, date and I'll be there. <laughs> oh, you know what? I remember when you know, I, I remember. came here and you talked about the different concept you have, which is, you know, most businesses remain the same or very complacent. And that's not what you ladies do there. And I thought no, that was no. the exciting part of what you do. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate that you recognize that. And, and like I said, I mean, our whole thing is, is, look, I mean, cell phones connect us, cell phones and technology. We wouldn't be on this call right now. We wouldn't be connected via Zoom and having these conversations. But at the end of the day, we're born as humans and we're physical beings. So it only makes sense that physical locations have to be a staple in our lives. So what better way to do that than connect with visionaries and artists and, and musicians and, and business leaders that are passionate about what, about what they do. We want to speak with them because if, you know, when the tide comes in, it lifts up all the boats and we're looking to lift up an entire community, not just, you know, one aspect of it. So, um, you know, and, and we also recognize that a lot of new residents are moving not only to yes. Yorktown, but um, Northern Westchester. And my whole thing is that they're coming from Manhattan where their coffee shop was at the ground floor of their, ba of their building. And now they're, they're living very much in the suburbs and they're starting families. And where's that natural point of congregation? Well, we want to say that's the Valley. You know, we're rolling out one of the first uh, nursing rooms sponsored by Valley Pediatrics right now. Uh, we're in talks of rolling out a sensory room that way that children that are on the spectrum or families that have children with special needs, so, like they have a home and a place within our center. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're really refurbishing and enhancing our hub, which we're welcoming, um, you know, entrepreneurs and remote workers to come and, and disconnect from the house a little bit. I know it gets crazy when, when the kiddos are talking in the background and things like this, but for a chance for them to kind of plug in their computer and talk to the person next to them, and that's natural networking, that's natural progression. So, you know, we're here to assist in anything. There's no such thing as a crazy idea. We're willing to hear it out. Um, and we're really fueled by passion right now to really, you know, get this done. Um, we're, we're really committed to, to ensuring that Jefferson Valley, you know, stays dynamic and continues to be dynamic in, in its offering. So any other, any questions, feel free to let, let me know because uh, we okay. really are serious okay. about this. The team's been great. Team's I mean, Alexa and Heather and Steve, we, we've been talking a lot about all their different ideas. They've got a ton of energy, a ton of focus. And honestly, they're, they're you know, they're, <laughs> They're committed. They're committed to this town. They're committed to this community. They're committed to their center, um, and they're doing a great job. Uh, Alexa, what was the number we said that you have of capacity right now? How much of, of your space is filled? Seventy percent at and, this time, and and, right. and growing every day. I mean, we really are talking to other businesses. Um, we're talking to businesses in and around the area where they're being asked by many other developers and many other parts of Westchester to make their home there. You know, when you see something and you see a dynamic business, you feel that energy, you know that they're onto something. Um, other people are actively searching for them. And we have this way of bringing them into the center. And then all of a sudden they, they say out loud, mm, maybe I was, really wasn't considering the Valley until this conversation. And then all of a sudden an hour meeting turns into two hours. It turns into three hours. And it's like, right. all right, how do we get this stuff done? You know, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of nuances. I know we have to, you know, do a lot. Of course, that makes sense. A lot of logistical practices that are put into place, but we want to ensure that, you know, we're bringing the top talent in the center and into the town. So Thank you, Matt, and everybody here for all of your support. Uh, we really truly, uh, truly appreciate it, and this won't be the last time that we sit in front of you and ask you to 
granted us something in our favor. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for the town during the pandemic. We thank you for allowing all of what took place to happen. Oh, thank you. We were, we were glad to do that. I mean, I think we hosted seven graduations, which was wild. And, you know, we turned into the number one graduation destination and the eating West I mean, it was fun. It was so much fun. And, 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 and we've learned a lot through COVID. I mean, some of these things like car parades and honoring our seniors in different ways. I mean, this, these are going to be with us forever. So we learned a lot of great lessons and a lot of great tools and uh, it, it didn't slow us down by any means. It just it added more light to our ideas, if you will. Um, and, and just stay tuned. You're going to see a lot more coming, coming out soon. Excellent. Excellent. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And yeah. if we can, if we can get that uh, public hearing scheduled earlier, we'll do all, everything in our power to get there. I know that our, our clerk's office is going to work hard on that. Uh, but uh, we, we really do appreciate your continued investment and commitment to the town and to the center. Councilman, do you. you want to say something? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I, I forget if I brought up to Alexa or to Heather, but uh, someone had sent me a video clip of a show from, I, I want to say 1985. It was a, and it was, it was based on a lip sync contest at the mall. But it, <laughs> but you guys had a, it seems like they had a whole video production that that went uh, that, that went uh, live uh, like w probably once a week or once a month because it looked like it was episodes of it. I think I think Mr. Paganelli may have been in that uh, lip sync contest. That's what that <laughs> it stuck on. And, and you know, it's funny. It's funny you bring that up because I was actually. I was actually in touch with the gentleman who created that mini TV series today, and we're hoping, you know, this is this is a very secret uh, preliminary, you know, to be saying out loud here, but we're hoping to bring it back in some way, shape, or form. So, yes, people enjoy those shows, and uh, we're looking into it again. So. Well, I know I also gave you that other idea, which I won't mention, that I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I think that would work right yep. in. Yep, I already mentioned that as well, so we're... Uh, we're on top of that one too. Good, good. I think that would be phenomenal for for the experience. Yeah. And, and, and that's what that's what it seems. The last few times that I've been to the mall, there's much more of an experience happening. It's not just about shopping. It's, mm -hmm. it's there's a lot going on there. And pretty soon, you know, you'll you'll be able to uh, have golfers drop the rest of the family off and go yeah. to World War three right next door. <laughs> so some some. You know, I I is that. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Yeah, the the the, the uh, Jefferson Valley Mall has been a community mall since it's been built. Um, I remember the grand opening. I forget the name of the store when it first opened up, where Macy's was is. Uh, but um, it's it, it, you were shoulder to shoulder in there during um, Christmas time. There was no parking. The whole nine yards. It was a staple in this community, and I think it's going to be revitalized as a staple in this community. And I want to thank you, Steve and Heather, Alexa, for, for trying to achieve that for this town. Yes. Absolutely. And I appreciate your support very well, much. We see you before us on a couple of other issues, too. Well, we look forward to having you back. And we appreciate, again, all you've done. And like I said, if we can get this uh, public hearing done uh, sooner, we will. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good project. I think the town board thinks it's a good project. And we'll Absolutely. get through the process as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. We're looking forward to seeing you again next uh, next month or two. Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks, folks. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Bye. 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 Now. Bye. Bye, Bye. Okay. Next, we are going to welcome our building inspector, John Landy, and Mike. Hey, John. And I think Hi, we have. How are you? Hey, John. Hi. Hi. And I think we have Mike Mr. DeWan with John. us. Mike, are you there? I hey, am Mike. here. How are you? I'm doing fine. What are you all doing in my bedroom? Yeah. <laughs> You're just four years. <laughs> nice, to, <laughs> nice to meet you all. Nice uh, to meet you. Uh, John, Mike, is, Mike and John are here to discuss and, and present to the town board uh, for our consideration the New York Stretch Building Code. Um, this is an energy efficient building code that the state is poised uh, to adopt in the, in, the, in the next few years. 
Um, but Mike I, uh, and John, I don't wanna take too much firepower away from you. So please introduce us to the New York Stretch Building Code and what it intends to do. Sure, Mike, I go? go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, I'm gonna launch right into this presentation. I do have a granddaughter who's uh, patiently awaiting a story that I will be going her tonight. So. <laughs> no worries, no worries. And she's tough. She's very demanding of my time. But uh, again, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. And it's been a pleasure to work with uh, your, uh, I can't remember whether yours is a sustainability committee or a climate smart committee or a clean climate energy smart. committee. It was DSC. It was the climate smart communities task. Okay. Force you presented to. Yep. I, I've worked with over 40 communities uh, down in your region. And I, they all tend to kind of run on at this point and have different names for their committee. Anyway, so we're gonna give you a little introduction. Um, of course, talk with that committee. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, and look at some issues for you folks who are the leaders of this community. And uh, uh, thankfully, and I'm appreciative of being able to work with you who are forward thinking enough to consider this as well as the clean energy community uh, program itself. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to full screen on this in case we want or need to jump around in the presentation, but I'm assuming you can see my screen okay? No, not yet. Nope. You got to share screen. Oh, okay. It's not, uh, okay. I did that once. There you go. Yeah. Good deal. Great. Okay. So, um, one of the, of course, the, the, uh, the New York stretch code is just a great way for your community and the many communities who are considering and, and have adopted uh, it uh, to deal with your building energy usage, as well as create economic benefit for the community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, a big part of that, of course, and the reason you're considering this is that uh, the New York stretch code um, can bring you recognition and grant and incentive funding uh, from NYSERDA uh, as well. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, adopting the New York stretch, and I'm sure you all know this by now, but maybe you don't. Uh, for the CEC, you are awarded 1,200 points, which makes it the second highest point getter. You also get a direct, as a small community, a direct $5,000 grant for adopting the, the, the uh, New York stretch code that's offered by NYSERDA. Uh, but more importantly, that 1,200 points towards uh, many tens of thousands of dollars of potential incentives to do uh, projects and programs in yeah. energy efficiency uh, as well. Uh, in order to get those uh, points, you need to adopt no later than uh, the end of this year, December 31st. And I get, we can, um, you can tell me to throw out the anchor and we can uh, answer questions as I go through this or wait to the end, your call. You keep pushing through. Okay. Uh, so most importantly, it's a, this is a readily adaptable uh, energy code made possible by Article 11 of the New York State Energy Law, which was being adopted while I was being uh, a high performance builder of homes and small commercial buildings in the Tri Lakes region of the North Country, Lake Placid, Saranac Lake. And uh, so that means I'm old and I've been around, you know, maybe too long with this stuff, but uh, <laughs> found myself working with folks. Uh, code officials, builders, designers that were friends and colleagues back then to try to help make this code um, more understandable when New York uh, developed its own code. But at the same time, we adopted this Article 11 um, uh, statement that uh, communities can adopt a more stringent energy code. And communities have been doing that ever since. In fact, the, the Hudson Valley region is his, historically fairly famous for that. Uh, it prepares communities for future codes. Uh, it's about a one cycle code. 
the incremental cost is a one to two percent higher than the base uh, 2020 uh, New York State Energy Code, which your community is currently enforcing. Um, and uh, most important is it is an overlay code. It doesn't require builders to use any, you know, state of the arts or advanced technologies. Just a little more of this and a little more of that. Again, about 11% more efficient uh, overall. <clears throat> it also doesn't, it, since it's an overlay of the New York State Code, it requires no extra work or effort. All of the enforcement details are the same as the base New York State Energy Code. Uh, and that's, that's key because um, uh, code officials uh, are pretty, pretty out straight right now, especially post COVID. I don't know about Yorktown specifically, but all of the Hudson Valley communities and all the way up the Hudson River to uh, the North Country where I spent a bunch of years building, uh, are going through a building surge and renovation surge like never before. Um, lots of benefits to your community. Lower energy use has been proven for decades. And as long as I've been in the energy efficiency game, uh, you know, energy that's saved and energy dollars that are saved in your community stay in your community. They build equity, they build jobs, they build reinvestment in the community. Um, and of course, uh, at that same time, they most comprehensively um, uh, address what is on, on an average nationally, 40% of our building energy usage, which is that of buildings. Uh, could be more uh, in New York State because our utility bills are, are fairly high. Uh, lots of community benefits, as I suggested, lots of new uh, economies being generated for this, for this uh, purpose, um, jobs in energy efficiency and construction uh, are, are right at the forefront of some of the investments that New York State are making. Um, and of course, all the codes, but as well, the energy code helps improve the durability and resiliency of, of buildings. And, you know, during this, this COVID, COVID uh, uh, phenomenon, uh, it also makes buildings that are healthier because of some of the advanced uh, ventilation requirements. And, and most importantly, it assures that uh, there's a minimum level of efficiency and comfort. Again, uh, about 40% of our energy usage. Uh, to look at what it costs, because you know it's, it is more efficient and there is an increased cost that uh, everyone is, uh, is concerned with. And I know that folks there are as well. Um, this is a statewide uh, weighted average of uh, two different building types for residential. You can see that the incremental cost, the cost over the base code is about $2,000 for single family, 1,500 for uh, multifamily uh, with paybacks of five and a half and nine, uh, just under 10 uh, years, simple payback. And that is most important to, to catch that this is without taking advantage of, and on any of the many incentives available from NYSERDA, from Con Edison, from your utilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is really important because many of these incremental cost increases, which are very small, as you certainly know, given today's cost of construction and home costs in your region, especially uh, very, very small increment. Uh, based on the climate degree zone, which is, you know, the, the code is more stringent in, um, in uh, colder sections of the state, yours being the, the warmest, uh, the cost impact for residential is uh, displayed here um, for multifamily uh, it's about something under 1500 and this is uh, now specific to your region and just under 2500 for 
single family with paybacks of around 10, 10 years for both. Again, using the most conservative, restrictive compliance path that the energy code offers, as well as not taking advantage of incentives. Mike, can I ask a question while you, as you go through this? Who will, is this a, um, a cost that every resident will have to pay? or only those who are going into the building department to have something new done on their property or have to have a new home built? So well, if, if it's a residence and it's a new construction, it has to comply with the energy code. It should be getting a permit, period. Right, uh, but these costs- To answer your question, cost, Alice, it, it cost would be to the person coming in for a building permit. Building okay, that, new. that's what I had to understand. Yes, it's not across the board board to every resident. Yeah, it's only for those who these are, are and these are averages. The full cost benefit analysis is something that uh, is available, and I'll show you where it is as we get farther along. Okay, here. but and again, these are averages. It can be higher, it can be lower, and uh, you know, if you want to leave money on the table, well, that might be what your cost is, um, but. Uh, there are incentives to offset all of this. On the commercial side, which is a little bit smaller and smaller in, in I think, most of, of your district, um, looking at nine different types of buildings, again, uh, about, a, about a little over a dollar a square foot incremental cost, 10 and a half years, simple payback. Uh, in the region as a whole, it's a very high uh, amount of the new construction, 71% uh, cost savings and incremental cost. Uh, again, very reasonable and simple payback. A little over 10 years here. Again, though, um, you know, without taking advantage of any incentives, which is very important. Um, the the code and the residential code, which no doubt. Uh, you folks will be most involved in, uh, has the same number of compliance paths. It works the same. The numbers are just a little bit different. Um, prescriptive path, which doesn't mean much to any of you, but that's the most restrictive path. And that's what those, those costs are calculated with. There is within the code itself ways uh, by performance and passive house and ERI, which you see, um, more cost-effective ways to show compliance with the code. Um, and the easiest one being um, using the, the free DOE software that many communities uh, use and ask for with the permit applications as it is. Uh, on that front, there is uh, a couple of the best tools uh, that uh, have been developed that also have been enhanced by NYSERDA is uh, the check software. It's ComCheck for commercial buildings and renovations, ResCheck for residential buildings and re renovations. And you can see down here that there's a version that your designer or your builder can click on and you use that to uh, check to make sure their design complies before submitting to the code official, hopefully. Um, What's different about it? Again, it's very small changes in a few different areas that uh, NYSERDA determined and uh, cost estimators and people who have provided uh, feedback to this um, uh, uh, developed. Uh, so there's some improved window performance and insulation, um, a little bit of commissioning requirements uh, lighting and electrical is, is upgraded some. Uh, mechanical systems have been upgraded some. Uh, but, but basically uh, in the control areas rather than the equipment, which is, uh, which is regulated at the fe uh, federal level, um, there is requirement for solar and electric vehicle uh, charging readiness. That doesn't mean you have to install it. We'll talk about that more in a second. On the commercial side, uh, uh, some more efficient commercial equipment uh, requirements. Uh, 
and roughly the same on the residential side. One of the uh, advances that the New York stretch has, as I showed before, is the passive house compliance path. The passive house, I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but it's a, a housing program that goes beyond the code uh, considerably. Uh, it has gained a, a tremendous amount of attention and is a very desirous program for people to, to be in. Well, folks, if they're, if they're going to the passive house standard, they can use it to comply with the energy code too. So uh, there's a, a really handy comparison document that's on this website here. Did I send you this? I'm not sure if I sent you this presentation or not. Again, I, uh, I'm old, so I forget stuff. Uh, many times I do, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to send it to you afterwards. That'd be great, Mike. Thank you. Mike, I, just to, if we could just go back for a second, one of the questions, yep. uh, well, it's just unrelated to that slide, but this was developed by NYSERDA, and, it, and it's our understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that it's going to be adopted as a state code in a matter of two to three years. Is that, is that accurate? No. No, that's and, not. You know, it's, just, it's the strangest thing that that keeps going around, but it uh, the New York stretch code is not going to be adopted itself. Okay. Uh, the New York stretch code is roughly equal to the national model code, which is the international energy code that New York state bases its every three year um, uh, adoption upon. Okay. And uh, so the, this New York stretch code is, uh, jumping out ahead of that a little bit, it's it's actually uh, different in a number of ways, and and in a number of ways easier to comply with than that code that will come into effect in 2022 or 23, probably 23 if they're on time this year. So it prepares you for that, and it also aligns you with incentives that makes it more cost effective because you won't get incentives for doing the base. New York State Energy Code, and there'll be another, uh, a, a next version New York stretch code at the same time as well that'll be offered up. Understood. So it, it's not being adopted itself, a, a code that's roughly equal to what it, the energy savings in the stretch will be adopted in 23 or thereabouts. Is that clear for the board? I just want to make sure that that's understood. Yeah. Again, that keeps that rumor keeps flying around. I don't know where it gets its start. I know that there have been a, a couple of builders that say, well, if we're adopting it in three years, why bother adopting it now? Um, well, because you can take that's what advantage of what, what's that? That's what I that that is first in my mind. Yeah, it's 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 just um, what's that? I'm sorry, uh, Councilwoman, why adopt it now? I adopt it now because because I, as I have explained a couple times here, you do get a chance to take advantage of incentives <laughs> that pay the cost of it down. Therefore, the builders get it adapted into their systems. Again, these aren't huge changes; they're very very small changes, and the you know builders and designers particularly uh, get to bring these requirements and concepts into their design now and get the utilities to help pay for it. Um, I, the, the one thing to remember here is that the energy code is the only building code that pays for itself. The only one in energy savings and other benefits. I hear you. Can now, I ask something new? Yeah, yeah, Councilman Patel, you have a question? Yes, sir. Councilman Patel? Yes, sir, okay. Let me just uh, make it uh, understand very clearly. This is, for heating and cooling, uh, you can you know you need the energy to bring the water. You can save the water, the energy, and the wastewater treatment, insulation, new material like that. So this is, includes everything, or only the energy in terms of solar uh, and gas and the liquid. You know th all these three form of energy you need to run the business and uh, industry and everything else. This is only residential only, right? No, no. We, we talked about commercial as well. Uh, commercial right. cost effectiveness, 
uh, et cetera. Okay, commercial buildings and residential, and it's new construction and renovations, additions and such, just like the current energy code. We have an energy code in place that is the base of this and that this, this is overlain on top of uh, that requires these things. And it's, it's, what it's doing is producing what's known as demand side savings. It doesn't take into account solar or it doesn't take into account how much energy you use. The intention is to reduce the amount of energy used by the building. Just that simple. Make it efficient first before we jump into electric heat pumps or solar or what have you. Uh, otherwise, we run down the same uh, broken path that the utilities have been dragging us down for years. Use more and more and more and more, don't save anything and uh, help their business model, which is wonderful, but uh, it doesn't save uh, it doesn't save either uh, communities or the people in them or the, you know, the climate uh, impacts as well. I do hear from time to time, uh, well, what is this going to do to, um, you know, the developers who are cleaning up uh, those commercial buildings on uh, Main Street and, and uh, renovating them and bringing business back into our communities? Again, uh, the, that works just like the existing energy code. When you change something out with something new, only that has to brought up, be brought up to compliance. In other words, if you're putting a new roof on it and replacing the old beat up insulation, you only have to bring it up to the, that roof up to code. And in fact, I had a contractor down your way when I was working with the town of Bedford um, who uh, looked into that, who wanted to look into this and was concerned that this was gonna impact his business and adversely said, well, you know, is this gonna ruin all my, my uh, <coughs> roof jobs, my roof replacement jobs? And so we took a look at it <clears throat> and the, uh, the existing energy code, the current energy code uh, required when he replaced the roof covering and the insulation on the flat deck over top of it, uh, he had to replace it with R30 to the current code. That's what's in the law now. Okay. Uh, it only required to go to R33 to go to the New York stretch code. He, you know, he immediately was relieved and said, oh, you know, uh, that wouldn't even affect my pricing. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, um, you know, not a not a big deal in the context of, of what buildings are, are costing and selling for. They're having more problems, builders are and designers are, developers are with availability of basic building products like lumber uh, and sheet goods, plywood and OSB, rather than uh, the cost of insulation. Um, you could locally amend the New York stretch, uh, stretch, but if you want the credit for the CEC program, which you sure, certainly do, I imagine, uh, it can't be amended to adversely impact the, uh, the rest of the codes of New York State. And it has to be stronger yet than New York stretch. A couple of communities have done that. Uh, but NYSERDA has uh, has vetted this code with New York State Department of State, which you have to file with when you adopt. Um, and of course, um, you know, all the tools or training are, are developed for this code, not, and not possible for uh, individual changes all around the state. There are a couple of differences. Uh, actually, they're advantageous for a number of the communities uh, back to the town of Bedford, they actually had an advanced code uh, years ago. It was based on the, I don't know if you folks ever heard of uh, Energy Star Homes, which was a program yeah. in New York for years. Yeah. A bunch of them, a uh, bunch of communities down that way uh, adopted that as the their stretch code because, again, 
the same law enabled them to do that. This just gives more options. And um, uh, one of the options is third party inspections for residential using a home energy rating, which is what was required for Energy Star. Uh, we took a look at it for a moment there. Um, and it's, again, it's a pro, it's a, it's a compliance path for the base code. You have to meet a 62 for the New York stretch, only a 50. So uh, they're using it uh, and they're having some uh, home energy raters actually do uh, a good part of the, 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 the work in plan reviewing and testing systems like they do for the base code and providing the documentation to the code official and the code official just has to review it and sign off on it and then inspect whatever they have time for mm -hmm. um, which is the case with all the codes your you know your code officials are uh, pretty hard pressed uh, with the the number of codes and the, the amount of work they have to do especially in this very active time. I, I, I swear to my friends in the code enforcement field that before I pass off this earth, I'm gonna click my heels and get them a big bag of money for each of their jurisdictions to, uh, to invest in things they need. But um, um, this code again, is, it, it's no different than the base energy code and doesn't create any more work. There's lots of resources there's myself and the other circuit riders. I'm the circuit rider for Westchester and uh, uh, the, the larger cities in the Hudson Valley region and a few other uh, towns and villages. There's an adoption guide with a model local uh, uh, law that you can, you can just modify for your uh, municipality. Um, there is some, uh, some minor changes coming to that adoption guide. So uh, if you get along with this, uh, do reach back to us, make sure that you have the latest, but you'll be hearing probably from me before that time with those latest uh, changes that you can incorporate. There's free training and uh, there'll be more yet uh, code enforcement tools and checklists. Uh, there'll, there'll be a single volume of the energy code book with the New York stretch code requirements laid into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the code official only has to go to one book. And uh, as I said earlier, the res check and com check uh, compliance tools are available free online. They are developed by um, the, New the uh, United States Department of Energy and some friends of mine at the Battelle Pacific Northwest Laboratories. They're free for designers and builders to use. There's a hotline for, uh, in, for questions and technical assistance. Uh, again, all of these documents are located here on this site and, and they're all designed for this, um, this New York stretch code. This, uh, this list keeps growing. Uh, we've got uh, three or four other communities right now um, that are adopting in your region, which is way out ahead of the other regions uh, because it's very competitive for this clean energy community grants there. Um, and it includes all of these communities in, in red here, many of your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, I'm, I'm working with probably I think there's there's an, another well there's there's three or four in the process right now and there's probably twelve to fourteen who are on their way as well. Uh, I don't always hear from them to know exactly where they're at with it, but uh, nonetheless, uh, very popular down your way as it's a you know your region is progressive. You're forward thinkers compared to a lot of the rest of the state. Um, and um, everybody's uh, working hard on the clean energy community thing, which I applaud you all for. Um, so this is how you get help. Your clean energy community coordinator, I don't know if she has uh, presented to all of you yet. I know she has to your committee. Uh, there's the stretch, the NYSERDA stretch uh, 
circuit rider program, which I am a circuit rider of. Here's all my contact information. Uh, if you need to talk to that program manager, uh, I can bring questions to him or you can contact him directly here. And on the clean energy community program itself, it's best to contact Carla because I know just enough about that program to get in trouble. <laughs> and with that, um, that's my presentation. If uh, you have other questions. What? Mike, I want to just bring John in real quick. John, you and other members of the building department it took your first class on it to, to see uh, some of the details of the stretch code. Could you provide some feedback to the town board well, on the class and what your thoughts were? Well, like what Mike said, it's not a huge uh, cost difference for the builders. Um, it does help the community in the program that it offers. Uh, First, the first few classes that we, we took two classes, one for residential, one for commercial. Uh, I see that there are some benefits uh, to it. I see some challenges, but again, we only took a couple of classes um, and I, I think we can overcome them. What did you see, John? Uh, did you have my, uh, my, my good friend Casamina for the training? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, yes. What did you see as challenges and is what can, can I help you with there, perhaps? Well, again, um, we, we only took the two classes and um, right now uh, we're running at full bore. Uh, so so to, um, to do the extra reviews and inspections, uh, it, there might be some challenges there, but it's nothing that I don't think we can overcome with time as long as uh, we, we get up to date on more training. Sure, sure. Councilman Patel, you had a question? Yes, uh, you know, uh, in uh, New York City, uh, the multi-story building and the dimension of the apartments or condo, the total square footage is much, much less than here. So, and here, the you know, the building square footage Average is much higher than uh, and than a city, mm -hmm. so if you reduce the volume here, even in, in the suburb, you save a lot of energy. You know, just by so you don't have to have a larger uh, room to fill it up with a lot of furniture, the carpet, the wall, everything else, and you can still enjoy the benefits of uh, saving money and uh, good living in uh, in uh, Westchester or maybe further south from here or north. You know. Well, any that's, on that one? Yeah, that's that's you know that's why so many folks <laughs> are, are moving out of the city. In fact, I just talked to the the program manager a few hours ago for the city department of building, who's a longtime friend and colleague of mine, and uh, their stretch code is is one step uh, tougher, and they have some tough, much tougher rules to, mm. to get to them to. to meet it and they they focus on renovation because while there's plenty of new construction in the city uh, the big savings are in um, in upgrading where you can and where it's cost effective um, any renovations that you do yeah if if i may uh, i'd like to sit down with both you and and our building uh in building inspector and code enforcement and uh, discuss this. I've, I've been in the building trades for a couple of years mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I've seen the outcome of uh, too tight of houses and the non-use of outdoor resets and outside makeup air and so on and so forth. And um, not to bore the rest of the board with uh, this technical stuff where we've already increased stuff from two by four construction, two by six construction and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I'd like to possibly sit down with both of you and discuss this whole thing. I think you're on the right vein, Tom. Um, I would I would have preferred to hear this if we had information before this meeting. I cannot make any kind of decision based on what I just saw. I don't yeah. think anyone's looking to make a decision. It was an informational, uh, okay. uh, just information sure. for us to understand the New York Stretch Building Code where where it's coming from, what it's trying to uh, 
accomplish. It's something that the CSC task force um, took very high to. And so I think it's just a first introductory step for the town board to understand what it is, what it looks to accomplish, and we can continue to explore it together. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to delve further into this yeah. because uh, there are some inherent problems with a too tight of a house. And uh, both John and Michael, I think, know what I'm talking about. But I would like to discuss this with you guys uh, uh, in, in, in another uh, atmosphere uh, so we can well, get right, I, right down I, to technical I'm resources. Glad, I'm glad to get on and set up a Zoom with you and John anytime you want to. Uh, and, and as Mike said, though, Tom, um, although New York is not going to adopt the stretch, but the next, we all see the next uh, code change is going to be pretty close to it, if not even more stringent than the stretch code. And exactly. the programs that the stretch code give us to prepare for that um, might not be a bad thing, but it, it might be a great thing for us to all sit down and and discuss it further, Tom. Yeah, I I, I, I definitely think so. Like I say, I, I've I've been in this industry for a couple of years, and uh, uh, I, I've seen the good and bad of uh, a, a lot of these energy that the DOE has come up with a lot of things that 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 uh, for lack of a better word are ridiculous. Uh, well, uh, just so you know, nothing in the New York stretch tightens the building any more than it already is. There's no requirement for for that. It's only to make sure that uh, what's been done for it is done properly so it doesn't backfire on you. Uh, but there's nothing tighter about the New York stretch code. I agree with John. Uh, it's going to the the code that's adopted in 2023, if they stay on schedule, is going to be based on the 21 code, which is being printed this year. And uh, I would be given the Clean Air Act, the statewide uh, policy act that has been adopted, and not knowing yet what the directives are from it. It's my opinion, knowing a few folks on the committees that have been put together the stakeholder committees to figure out, you know, who does what towards that act. Um, it's my opinion that they're going to make that code equal to the 2021 international, you know, ICC code plus, uh, and plus perhaps quite a bit. Uh, okay. So, you know, like I said, I'd like to get on and discuss it with both you and John offline. So we don't, I don't have to bore people with the, uh, sure. Construction nonsense. You guys uh, name the day. Um, we could, uh, you know, daytime is better for me. Morning is best for me, but whatever fits your schedule, I'm glad to get on and go over this in greater detail and yeah. uh, look at some other stuff. We may have some renovation cost uh, estimating and cost benefit that's being done right now as we speak as well and just talk to you about it uh, you know for my background of being a builder and in this industry since the mid 70s well listen i think uh, a follow-up obviously would be a, a great step forward uh so we're happy to be to. But again just an introductory uh piece for the town board uh, to introduce you to the concept of the building of the new york stretch building code um, again trying to as we heard from our building inspector and from uh, Mike, uh, prepare ourselves for what's to come. So I think further investigation, of course, is, is always uh, welcomed. And, and so, Tommy, we'll give, you, we'll give you Mike's contact information, and you, Mike, and John can have a conversation. Great. We'll back. Great. Uh, you yeah. can, and you will have it as soon as I'm done here uh, as well. Uh, please, any of you, do not hesitate to pick up the phone and call me. If I'm not right there to answer your call, I will get back to you ASAP. You won't wait forever. Please take advantage of that. And in the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll get a meeting set up to uh, hash this out a little bit uh, more as well. Perfect. Matt, good good, yeah, good deal. Thank you, Michael. Matt, you do you have this PowerPoint presentation? Mike, can you, can you send this to, to us and I'll get it around to the town board? I am going to do that as soon as I get off here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mike. All right.
you, you, you folks all be well and thank you for the opportunity to present to you and thank you for being leaders in your region. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks, and Mike. I, I mean that. I'm not blowing any smoke. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Hope you, get, you. Uh, get that story time in with your granddaughter. That's right. I, exactly. She's my fishing buddy. You know, I got to keep her in good shape. <laughs> totally get it. Take care now. Bye -bye. Yeah, okay. Good, Good night. night. Bye -bye. Good night. All right. Uh, we're going to go over to the Traffic and Safety Committee. Uh, thank, we, thank you, John, for jumping on. We've got uh, our new picture. Is that our new, new picture for the highway? Yeah, Super that's a new picture. Highway? It's my happy picture. Oh, I just got uh, Rob Gore. I, I would say what? Rob Gore. <laughs> We've got our, our uh, yeah. traffic safety officer. Is that your puppy? And, uh, yeah, his puppy, of course. And yeah, Councilman uh, Diana, why don't you, uh, uh, Highway Superintendent Paganelli, you want to take it away? Okay, so um, on March 18th, we had a meeting, um, about three hours. Um, President were myself, um, Councilman Diana, and Police Officer Rob Rohr. Um, these are the things that were discussed. Nora, we had a request for a stop sign at the intersection of North Deer Deerfield and Oakside. The situation is such, Oakside already had a stop sign. We would have to add actually two stop signs to North Deerfield, and we tabled that until the next meeting so we could take a look at that intersection and see if it's really necessary. Okay, we did have a speed concern with respect to Quaker Church Road. Um, the person wanted to add a stop sign at Oslo Drive to make the intersection a three-way stop um, to slow speeding in the area. Um, the traffic safety committee cannot place stop signs at a location as a traffic calming device, according to the manual for uniform traffic control devices, which is written by the federal highway administration. We believe that, but they added speed enforcement to the area, PD speed trailer, and the added signage that we will put up additional 30 mile an hour signs. It'll help slow the traffic. Um, we had a request for a stop sign at the intersection of Granite Springs Road and Quaker Church Road. We would like to add a stop sign to the uh, for southbound travel as you're coming down Granite Springs Road. If you make a left, you would follow Granite Springs Road into Somers. If you bear to the right, you become Quaker Church Road. Right now, there we had added about two years ago, three years ago, a stop sign heading northbound on Quaker Church Road. We believe one um, is appropriate heading southbound to tighten up that intersection and make sure people coming out of Evergreen and as well as people making the left turn and people coming northbound on Quaker Church Road, um, each person gets a turn and gets an opportunity to get out safely. So that is one we would like to add in. Um, we would like to add a stop sign at Chesterfield and Cross. Um, the other roads that Prior Hill, um, Valley View, Hudson View, they are four-way stops, and we think that this one is just somehow or another got left out. So this would be a stop sign to make that a four-way stop as well, cross road being the connector that goes out, you know, to Cranberry and then to Mill Street. Okay. Um, we had had a question of resident had an issue with respect to speeding on Meadowcrest Drive. Um, Officer Rohr went out, um, did three days of speed monitoring and not one speed um, violation that occurred. So we don't believe that um, they had a request to speed bumps, they requested a stop sign, you know, and we did not, not only the low volume of traffic, but also the fact that there were no speeders. Um, oh, I would like to defer with respect to um, updating the town code, we discussed this. And I would like to defer this to um, Officer Rohr, and he could um, bring you up to date on this, as well as he will bring you up to date on the on the um, commercial vehicles, trying to stop commercial vehicles from coming to the center of town. And that would be based on the last item as um, weight limit signs. So, Officer Rohr, do you want to step in? Yeah, absolutely. How's everyone doing tonight? Hey, Ben. Hey, Rob, how are good. you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so we were just looking to update the town code, um, basically to help us out, just streamline the process of adding stop signs to the town. Right now, it takes us probably like a good like six months to add a stop sign just into a simple intersection in, uh, in a neighborhood. And it's mainly just the whole process of, you know, 
us voting on a stop sign, then it goes to the town board, they vote on it, then it goes up to Albany and they have to sign off on it. So we well, like and it gets a public hearing as well. Exactly. So we'd yeah. like to try to streamline that process to basically just update the town code to stay like every um, roadway that comes to a T-type intersection, you know, every vehicle must come to a full stop or a yield um, and they must yield the right of way to vehicles traveling on that roadway before, you know, crossing or entering that roadway, regardless of whether there's a stop sign or not. Rob, just you want your tickets to be made um, available because if you don't, you have a ticket. The police officer, as you know, can only write a ticket for whatever based on the law that's on the books. Exactly. So what we would like to do is sit down with the town attorney um, and just basically kind of hammer out like legal terms on how to get that to update into the town code. So we can just add a stop sign without having to go through the entire process. You can there's no possible way of this knowing. Is, you, you want to create a local law for that stop sign. Mm -hmm. The only way it, it becomes a law is that it goes by the same route. And it's I, I, six months. It should not take six months because once the town board agrees to um, perhaps doing these stop signs, um, there's no review of it. You guys decide it. And then it goes out for a public hearing. And yeah. then it's added to the code. So I don't know where you got six months at, but you well, have to do it. Woman, I, I guess, I don't know. I wasn't on when the mall was setting up their public hearing, but the impression I got was they were going to get try to be moved up. So my, my interpretation was it wasn't going to happen next month. Um, I think public hearings get backed up at least a month or two. And then by the time it gets to Albany, Albany makes their decisions. I would not say it's a stretch. Here, to say Albany it's has 10 days to, to, uh, to well, say. Somebody nothing. better get them that memo. <laughs> yeah, I, I do agree, Dave. I've huh? been, been trying to register something for, for two weeks yeah. now, and, and, and it's still sitting there. Yeah, um, but, well, it's their problem if they don't get back to you within the 10 days. But Adam, if you give Adam the information <laughs> you want, he does a local law. We do, and we advertise it for a public hearing. It's as, it's as quick as that. No, and I and I agree with you. I, I was just trying to figure out a way to streamline it so we could, so basically any road in this town, we send that up to Albany and basically say that any road in this town that comes to a T-type intersection, I mean, in the rules of the road, you must do that anyways, regardless of whether or not there's a stop sign. You must yield the right of way to the vehicles on that road. I understand road. that. Yeah. Right? So I would like to try to figure out a way where we can sit down and try to hammer out a, a way to legally make it send it up to Albany basically saying that the town has a discretion to put a stop sign at any roadway where there's a t-type intersection or four-way intersection you know as we please I don't know how to put that in when do people get the right to object to that and they do that in public hearings exactly so once we we can put that to a public hearing as long as we say and, and everybody agrees to it in a public hearing then we can just go and put the stop sign up without having to send everything up to Albany and wait for Albany to figure it out and then send it back to us. You know, you're asking to, to you know, having, uh, Diane, let, let the clerk explain to you what the legal requirements of this other, of sending the law up to Albany is. I'm not quite sure what you mean by sending up to Albany. Now, if you're referring to once we do a public hearing on vehicle and traffic law, we put up a stop sign or whatever, it, it gets filed with the um, with the state. Mm -hmm. Normally, within a week or so, we get yep. back a notification from them. It's not normally two weeks. It's pretty. It's pretty quick. But yep. a local law can be established, you know, to take place as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah I so think that's could... what I think that's what what uh, uh, Rob is in, intending is that if we have a law in place that allows us to put, you know, a blanket law, so to speak. You that would allow us coming. hang on one minute alice that allows us to put a stop sign up not willy-nilly but as per the rules of the road and a new york state vehicle and traffic law explain to me how residents are going to know that if they do something it's wrong and they're liable to get a ticket well oh. you, you know they're, they're, <laughs> they're, well there's actually, no ignorance to the law all right you know that's that's one thing you're talking uh, state law is that it What's that? You're talking ignorance to state law, not to town law. State law, which has, which now has to mirror. If I'm correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm 
wrong, Rob, that even the state law, the town law, when it comes to B and T has to mirror one another because yeah. we basically can't write for, not we minor. can't write or that they, I'm sorry, they, they can't write for uh, uh, town law anymore because it's charged the same. Uh, so it would basically has to mirror one another. Right. And I think that the, the point in Alice, um, Councilwoman Roker may very well be correct. She was a town clerk forever. Right. But, my, but Sergeant Dillon came to us. Other municipalities have done this. Okay. This is not groundbreaking. So I, um, unfortunately, he's not here to explain the, the way it's worded, the verbiage that would be necessary. But am I incorrect that we, he was at our meeting? Yes, and he, you're right. Right. And he said other municipalities have adopted this what, local what law that allows the law is basically, honestly, when you pull up to an intersection, a T intersection, you're supposed to stop. If you never learn that, not you, but if anyone never learned no, that. No, but drug, that's true. I agree. Can, can so can I even if there's not a stop sign there, you can write him a ticket for not stopping. That's the idea. The idea is that when we're getting 20, 30 calls a month for stop signs, I mean, and speed bumps and all these other things. We would just like to try and simplify, you know, simplify the mechanism to to be able to say, hey, you're pulling out from Mark Road onto White Hill. And you know what? That's you can't go straight. It's not a four way intersection. You could only go left or right. You've got to stop. You know, they people just don't understand that they have to stop. That's the issue. And and well, I'm not a big tell you fan. How many people None of us to see me. And what they wanted was the code because they had gotten a ticket. They said, I just want to see your code to right. make sure the street's there. Yes. So um, this is Adam's issue. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think. Councilman Roper, I, I just want to make something 100% clear. We're not just going to throw stop signs up everywhere. I remember. No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying meeting. you would. We, but we, I'm we're saying. not. Well, yeah, we want to make sure it's, it's done legit, legit legitimately. We want to make sure that it's done right, and we're going to sit down and really discuss each each intersection that we're going to put a stop sign. We don't want to litter the town. I remember when you were in the traffic system. We didn't want to litter the yeah, town. Yeah, I agree with we you. We just want to make make the whole process more streamlined and easier for everybody. You know, when we sit down with with the traffic safety committee, we just want to be able to say, listen, we think that this stop sign, this intersection needs a stop sign. You know, and it goes to a public hearing, and they say, yes, you know, we agree with you guys as well. We can we can just go and put that stop sign. You know, and that's what we just want to try to make that that whole process a little bit more streamlined and quicker and easier and not have to deal with all the rest of the stuff. And that's, that's why we're going to sit down with Adam and just hammer it out and see if we can actually do this. That's what I really want to do is try to figure out if we can actually get this done. Because just as a clerk, right. the people have the right to be heard on any local law. Oh, 100 percent. There's and no, we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna sit and just put a stop sign up for no reason. Like I said, these are gonna come from complaints for the residents that live on those roadways, and they're the ones that really want that stop sign. Oh, I agree. You know, and, and not, I don't I, I don't right. want to put a stop sign up anywhere. I want if the people want a stop sign, that's what we're gonna do. You know, and if we really think that it's necessary, then that's what we're gonna do. So if it gets, if it's gonna go to a public hearing and and they feel differently and they don't want the stop sign, by all means, we won't put the stop sign up. But we just want to make the whole process after the after it's it's gone through a public hearing. We want it to just be a little, a little more streamlined and just quick and we can get the stops and up and move on to the next thing. You know? What I'm just saying is that the public has the right to be heard on oh, any law the town adopts. We're saying, we're saying after the public has had their, their time to discuss it and, and, sh and, and share their feeling on it, then we can just go ahead and put the stops on up if they agree with putting that stops on. That's yeah. all we want. I tend to want to agree with everybody because they're only talking about their area where they know what the traffic looks like. Exactly. So they I don't that every agree day. with that. Yes. The what unfortunate thing is people have the right to be heard on anything that goes into our local law. Oh, 100%. And that's fine. No one is arguing that fact. Certainly, as, well, as, as you alluded to. As you alluded to, you being a former town clerk, as a former councilman, I certainly understand that and um, sat there many nights and listened to everyone's concerns. So we're just looking to figure out a way. You know what? This will be a perfect example for us that we have two stop signs on. If the town board agrees with these two stop signs, I will take it from point A to point B and we'll see exactly how long it takes for these stop signs to get put up. Can well, I that, tell no, you that, that, that you don't that have to get to the board questions. first? Why don't you go to Adam first, get him to write the local law, he puts it on the town board's desk, and then right. you 
Um, and well, so that's, that's what we wanted to do. Whole, you've saved a whole meeting. Right, well, so that's, we've, that's, got, that's, we've, that's we've got two, we've got two stop signs right now. Mm -hmm. right? We're talking Granite and Quaker, Chesterfield <laughs> and Cross. Those mm -hmm. are the Correct. two stop signs. Adam, if you can, let's just run this as a parallel track if we can. So Adam, if you can just start drafting the laws to establish those two stop signs. In the meantime, um, maybe Adam, if you could work with the clerk's office, we can try, or and maybe Officer Dillon can just direct us to exactly yeah. what municipality has has this law in the books, so we can do some research on this to understand how it was implemented. Uh, but at least we can get a sense and run and run a dual track here, so we can take care of these two uh, stop signs, stop sign recommendations. Totally from agree. So we can go through that process. That also give us, to Dave's point, a timeline from point A to point Z through the whole process. So we get a, a feel for how long it actually takes and where where the stumbling block is. If the stumbling block's in the state, then you know we can we can try yeah, to. Yeah, I don't know how the stumbling block block could be with state because it's pretty well established. Ten days after it's it's sent up there and they haven't notified the clerk, it's a law. Yep. I agree. So then the stumbling block is somewhere else. It's us. And then we will find we will find out where the stumbling block is. So Dave, I'm, I'm more than I'm more than happy to work with you through the process so we understand each step of the process mm -hmm. so we can figure out where, where the malfunction is. I think that's that's the important thing. Yeah, it's it, you know what? It's oftentimes it's a lack of coordination, it's a lack of communication. So we're gonna see. We're gonna see how long it takes to draft up the law, we're gonna see how long it takes to get a public hearing. And then we're going to see how long it takes to hear back, and we'll know exactly where we're where we're coming up short. Not you a problem. Know, if you had gone to Adam before he came here tonight, and he oh, I wasn't a expecting to get law, We would be able to put it out to public hearing tonight. So, well, we wanted to discuss it with you because right. it's such a unique scenario. We this was just as the gentleman was on before. It was an informational thing. It's not about us looking to get this law passed now. It's about us making you aware of the fact that we would like to streamline this process and get it done in a more timely fashion because it's only going to continue. Uh, we've got requests for mirrors on intersections. Sure. We've got yep. You know, Alice, you were on the committee. You know what it's like. Yep. Right. You know, it's, it's just it's one thing after another. So whatever we can get done. You know what? If, 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 if Officer Dillon can tell us where what communities have it. Yes. Um, then that'll be that'll be great. Yes, and I'll, I think I'll, that'll help I'll Adam. Work on that. I'll work on that with my sergeant, uh, sergeant right down, and you. we'll try to figure that out. Like honestly, this is this is very this is very new to, to us. We're just trying to figure out how to get this. This is just we were just had an idea on maybe making this whole process more streamlined. I'm not saying this is set in stone. This is not 100, percent but this was just an idea that we came up with to try to make the process a little more streamlined. And if you guys aren't for it, and that's one, that's fine. No, 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 no. I, no, no, no. I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't that's the word we're, we're trying to look into. So you know, it just makes because Councilwoman Roker, you, you know, we spent half the time just going over a stop sign here, a stop sign there, a stop well, sign. And here, the good you know. part about that, you guys do not grant everything. Yes. And and so if uh, Adam had written that up to not written it up and we had it in local law form, we would have sent it out for a public hearing. We could have approved it for a public hearing. Yeah, hundred percent. We, you know, we just wanted to explain everything to the town board. No, I, I, you know, I just don't want you to think so, that I don't want something. Right. All right. So, Adam, we're going to work with Adam on drafting the law. Uh, Rob, you're going to go get with um, with uh, Officer Dylan, so that you can come back to us to see where you can let me know where absolutely that law exists, and then Dave, you and I can walk through the the stop sign process from A to Z. Yes. So we understand what that process is and if there's any breakdown, where it is, and if there's a way for us to streamline it, how we streamline it, right? I mean, that's that seems great. This is a perfect opportunity for us to see, yes. Great. Uh, Councilman Diana, you want to say something? Councilman, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Well, hold one second. Yeah, and, and I no. think I forgot what I wanted to say. Um, um, yeah, I had, I had mentioned this to Adam some time ago. I don't know if you remember, Adam. There's a lot that's gone under the bridge. Uh, a lot of water has gone under the bridge in this time, probably since March when we had our last meeting. I, say, I said hook up with Rob to see if he can hash out what this exact law is going to be about because it's it's kind of new. Um, and I was hoping that maybe Rob could have gotten a copy of the other law from 
Sergeant Dillon so he could have forwarded it to you and then we could have mirrored it and gone from there. Uh, so maybe that's something, Rob, now that you can you can reach out yeah, and get absolutely. from uh, uh, yeah, we'll, Paul. And at the, uh, next, at the next committee meeting, we'll sit down and, uh, and I'll have that information for you. That'd be great. That'd you know, be great. I know you guys work hard. Um, I sat here and Rob, you are just terrific. Um, and, and Dave, um, you guys, whenever we talk about something, Rob pulls out his little book, his computerized book of the year. Yeah, awesome. Amazing. Yeah, it so works good. One so, more issue yeah. um, that we discussed, and it was um, vehicle weight limits, um, signs uh -huh. for, um, I believe, I believe there's the purpose of this is to keep commercial traffic off of Greenwood Street and off of Northmore, basically um, keep it from coming through our town, through the center of town, coming down Commerce Street, making a left or a right onto Veterans Road, coming down to access either POSIs or whatever the case may be, um, or coming that way to access the back of Acme, you know, keep those commercial vehicles away from the nursery school, away from the track, away from um, away from the field when there are sporting events going on and children are running all over the place. And I believe we had discussed a 10-ton limit. Um, am I right, Tommy? Is that what we had said? Based on a, based on a school I, bus weight, we had figured was, what, 23,000 pounds, I believe? I got to bring it up again. I, I, I thought it was like 17,000, but I'm not, yeah. I don't recall. Um, and and uh, going, of course, by gross vehicle weight and so forth, we, we'd have to look at the weight again. But I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with the um, – with the amount of traffic, I mean, anybody that stood on, on uh, Veterans Road <laughs> and so forth would see that the amount of commercial traffic that goes there is crazy. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, if, if we reduce the weight limit on there, it'll keep a goodly amount of, of the large vehicles off of there, especially in the nursery school area, because our main concern is the health, the health and welfare, welfare of the people of the town of Yorktown. You know? Yeah, I Correct. Think I think what we really need to do is, is put weight limits on Greenwood veterans um, and, and, have them, and, and have the traffic come through 35 to Maple Hill Street, make a left on a veterans road, a right on a north moor, and then in, into Bosis. And that, that should get a lot of the commercial vehicles off of Commerce Street, which Commerce Street is already packed during rush hour. Um, and you know that'll keep a lot of traffic off there a lot of traffic off of, off of veterans road which you have the nursery school you have a lot of the foot traffic for the track you, ha you know you have the town stage there you know you have kids all over that area and i think that it would just be best to keep them off a lot of the commercial vehicles off of veterans road especially in that area and have them just come through the whole commercial vehicle or the commercial section of that entire district is right down maple hill street past you know the um the post office over there and make a left to go down past Solaris and then make the right up to Northmore and then in the BOCES. And then we, we are you going to create a truck route? Is that what you're saying? It, kind of. I mean, you could create a truck route just through doing um, just a weight, a, limit. Weight, a weight limit on all those roads that surround that area. So, so trucks know that they can't go down those roadways. And what about BOCES buses? The BOCES buses, it, it's you, you'd have to make sure that they come 35 Maple Hill and then up past Acme over there, make a left on a veterans and then up to Northmore. But what we really need to do for BOCES is sit down with BOCES, sit down with the bus companies and draw them out a route, highlight it, let them know this is what we need to do, especially for next year. So they know that this is what we're going to do from now on. And then when they exit, they need to exit off Pines Bridge. That's what their agreement was. We talked about that last time. Oh, gosh. Yeah, we've been talking about that forever. How, so, long, how, how long, Dave? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. on the board, so at least 10 years. So okay. what we yeah. really need to do is sit down with them and say, okay, oh, if you're going to come through the town, you're going you're gonna to enter through Yorktown, you need to exit from down Pines Bridge. And it's safer for the buses, too. You have a controlled exit on the 35 there. I don't yeah. understand why they don't do it. See, I think that it is smart for you guys to come up with a truck route. Say, yeah. oh, we don't want you to figure this out on your own. We're going to help. Oh, you. Absolutely. We'll help you. We'll draw it out. For you. <laughs> we'll literally draw you a map. That was, that was the to get to your school. Yeah. You know, and, and how to get out of your school. 
the safest route possible for everybody, including the buses and including the foot traffic in our town. I and it'll, it'll, it'll save a lot of the issues turning on a veterans road. Those buses can barely make that turn as it is mm-hmm. onto, from commerce onto veterans. And it'll save a lot of the pedestrian traffic. They don't have to dodge buses all day long on veterans road, especially with the nursery school. Right. You know, I think uh, if you come up with a plan before you go to the before yeah, you go no, absolutely. We're going to draw out a route. We're going to highlight it for them. And we're going to sit down and, and we'll sit down with, with BOCES and all the, the bus companies that, that serve as BOCES. Right. And, and, and we'll go through that. You know, if it's in traffic, it's and, yeah. and Sergeant Dillon, we'll do whatever it takes. But we just need to get that traffic off of Veterans Road. It's ridiculous. Yeah, the, um, they're actually out of their, the, their site plan for the back entrance that they use for the, bu- for the buses to come in and out. Yeah. is only supposed to be an emergency entrance. That yeah. is an ag- ag- agent yeah. entrance. In their site plan, it states that. So they're in violation of their site plan. Yeah. You know, Linda Cooper was <laughs> the first supervisor that I worked with when we, when we discussed this. And she was yeah. the supervisor in 96. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took to 2021. Now we're going to get it done. <laughs> well, if we get it done. you know. If we get it done. But I, mean, I think okay. having a plan, uh, having a route for them, that is yeah. maybe yeah. quite a crap, you know. I mean, the, the bus companies have routes. They, they have to follow the routes to pick up kids. I don't understand why they won't have to follow the route to, to get to the school and, and out of the school. I, sh- I think that, that should be no problem for them. Yeah. You know? Your committee's rate up some of reasonable men, so um, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Thank and and the, the average bus, Dave, is 24,000 pounds, full-size bus. Right. That's uh, what I think around 23. Yeah. yeah. So that 10-ton so lim- limit then at 20,000 pounds, yeah. it, it, it thought falls nicely into our objective of trying to keep them out of the center of town. Yeah. Yeah. The little buses, the little van-type buses are about 12 to 15. Okay. Councilman Patel, you have a question? Let me just say, you know, guys, when you take a driver license, the red light to stop and the green light you go, right? And then you get your license? Yeah. Who is enforcing? Yeah, it's very yeah. difficult to enforce. You know, party whole night and then say I was late in the morning. They, so as yeah. many light you want to stop, you want to put it in, I will go with you, no problem. How are we going to enforce it? You know? Well, very difficult. That's, a very, that's my job. Very, very difficult job, you know? How can you motivate or encourage or, or or punish whatever you want to say you know it's very difficult really well officer does a, is a does a pretty good job at right now to be yeah. honest yeah we, yeah. Are doing, we are doing you know the best we can but then let me tell you there is something else is wrong that the last five seven years 18 wheeler goes on my street to deliver a little box you know from Amazon or whatever. Okay. And there are more, you know, delivery truck came to every driveway, back it up and goes out, back it up and goes out. New way of living it, I don't know. Very so, uh, children are going on the, you know, in a street with a little bicycle and like that. All these things are very difficult problem we have with, with the traffic. So yeah. just to recap here though, so on the weight limit, uh, Dave, you wanted to do, uh, or I'm sorry, Officer Roar, Greenwood and Veterans was a weight limit? Yeah, so we would want to keep people off Greenwood because that's a residential road. Right. Uh, we so want to keep people what, off ten, You said what, Dave, a 10 ton limit? 10 tons, yes. All right, so then, yep. is, Adam, is that something that you can draft? That would up? be 20,000 pounds, which would clearly put the buses, the large buses that are having a problem on our Commerce Street and Veterans Road, it would put them onto the truck route. Okay. Matthew, I think they need to go and have their stuff together in terms of a presentation to BOCES. And- no, I agree. I agree. But I think in the meantime, we can just make sure that we're, we're clear on the specifics of what we're talking right. about. In addition to the weight limits, uh, Officer yeah. Moore is going to come up with, the, and, and the Traffic Safety Committee will come up with the, the route for the buses. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting with BOCES this summer before the school starts and see if we can get, the, see if they're amenable and see what we have to do to work with them. To, to fix the issue at hand. I mean, that's the only way we're going to get done is coordination and communication. So, so just to recap, you've got two, you got two stop signs, Granite and Quaker, Chesterfield and Cross. You've got weight limits on Greenwood and Veterans, and we're going to set up a meeting with BOCES to discuss the buses. Yep. Yeah, maybe, the, maybe we have them come to the, uh, our next little meeting uh, from BOCES. And, that's and, great. Uh, We'll discuss it with them right then and there before school ends. So we'll have to get together sooner than later. Yeah, well, and, you would, 
trying to set something up this week, so we're hopeful that this yeah. week or early next week we'll be able to get together. It's yeah, um, it's uh, we got a long weekend coming up and so forth. So yeah, that's uh, true. This way, this way we have it. Uh, they can work on it all summer long. Well, and the other thing is that you can have BOCES invite the bus companies to your meeting. Yeah, or we just go to BOCES one yeah. or that one day, yeah. you know, and just have all the you know the management and the bus companies sit down with us, and we can go over it together. Right. I'd like to have a, a safety committee meeting, a traffic safety committee meeting, just to hammer out exactly what we want before we sit down with BOCES. So we're all correct. Sense. Good yeah. idea. Get your plan. Good idea. Okay. Anything else from traffic safety? No, All right. We're good. Good job, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you. guys. Keep up the great work there, Officer Rory. Doing a great job. Thank you, sir. You really Have a good bad. night, guys. All right, now. Take care. Thank you. Last item on the agenda tonight, Chapter 7A of the New York State Public Health Law. Uh, this is uh, a discussion uh, that Councilman Diana is going to lead us in. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, once again, this is uh, uh, Chapter 7A New York State Public Health Law. We're basically going to, uh, uh, um, without reading the whole law and going through it, people can get that and look at it. Um, but this is for our opt-out program for the, uh, for the marijuana dispensaries. Um, actually, we probably should have had John Tegeter in on this, but we can get him in here on the next, on the next round. Um, just to go over, you know, site plans, et cetera, et cetera, and what's allowed and what's not. But that being said, uh, cities and towns and villages may opt out of uh, allowing adult use cannabis retail dispensaries or on-site consumption licenses by passing a local law by December 31st, 2021, or nine months after the effective uh, date of the legislation. They cannot opt out adult use legislation. So, that being said, this, this whole marijuana legislation, in my opinion, is not a well-thought-out law. There is no information in there about the use of marijuana in driving. There is no information in there about the testing for marijuana usage. And as early as about, oh, I'm going to say three weeks ago now, there was a lad that was driving um, – a bunch of kids home in a car, which resulted in a, a young lady's death because number one, he had a couple of white claws, whatever a white claw is. I've never had them. I don't know what it is. I don't know. And it, it's, I, a, uh, spar it's like an alcohol based seltzer drink. Okay. And, and this admittedly, he, he had a couple of joints. So that being said, um, you know, what's a life worth? That's my point on this whole thing. And the argument is going to be from people that it's not a gateway drug. Uh, it doesn't cause you to go do other things. There are noted authorities out there in the public that will attest differently. What, namely, one is Andrew Kolodny. Uh, Matt, you know him well, as I do, um, who is a noted authority on drug use and its effects. Matter of fact, I had him speak at a couple of uh, uh, Yorktown against heroin functions that we had okay. where he basically came out and said, it's a gateway drug, number one. Number two, we had the parents in this area, people, I'm not just parents, but people in this area up in arms about a vape shop. I remember. Let alone, and the man went out of business or woman, whoever owned it, um, you know, we have sad, we have mad, we have ads, we have a uh, drug crisis in our backyard. We have a, a married of, of, of um, organizations in this town that promote non-use of marijuana. And I think for us as a board to allow dispensaries to come into town, no matter the economic value, we constantly have to remember what is a life worth. And I am a hard no to dispensaries of marijuana coming into this town. And I, I, I hope that my, my colleagues on the board will feel the same way and we will opt out of having dispensaries here. I don't care what MAPAC, I don't care what Cortland, I don't care what Peekskill does. 
we have to stand true to our beliefs in this town and the way we feel about our children and, and our, not just our children, but our residents in this town to make sure that they are safe. Um, so that being said, um, I think I'd like to, uh, being this is a work session, maybe get this on as a, uh, would we have to put it on as a public hearing to opt out of this law at this point, correct? Yeah, you have to do a local law opting out. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, Can Adam speak on the law with regard to this? What are, um, because see, I think the chief gave us our most powerful argument, which you recited in terms of wanting to opt out. His people will not be able to, he's got one, one um, opioid recognition yeah. officer mm -hmm. and they will, he can't be everywhere. Um, so I think that to me was the, the strongest argument but the unfortunate thing is that even when we opt out, we're going to have that traffic coming through here, which means that we're still going to have to see whether or not we're going to be able to pay for other police officers to go through this kind of training. Because but at least we won't have people coming through here, Alice, to buy no, it and go back out. I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. I don't. I would. You know, I'm a, I'm a mother. Yep. And, and if my kids were small, there's no way I'd want this to happen. Right. And I just hearken back to the, to the vape shop. I mean, yes, nicotine, vape, and so forth is harmful, but it's not marijuana. It's not an intoxicant. It's not something that's going to make you numb. No, so you. That's about all I got. Adam, what do you think about the law? And, uh... Well, let me, uh, bear with me a second. I got to flip back sort of the, to my notes on this, because, uh, you know, we've uh, been looking at it. Um, but, excuse me one second. But so, yeah, I mean, to, to the point, I mean, we are allowed to opt out um, of, of the adult use cannabis retail dispensaries Right or on-site consumption licenses. We're not. There are there are certain aspects that we're not allowed to opt out by, and that has to be done by the end of the year. Right. What, what that what that means in terms of scheduling, just to get a sense of, um, let's put like actual timing. Right. We basically have to because it's subject to a permissive referendum. You got to kind of work backwards from that date and make sure you have enough time for the permissive referendum period to to go through its course to get it on the ballot. Um, if if in fact a permissive referendum were triggered, you know, by by petition um, for the November, you know, no, 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 excuse me, the November election. So I, ultimately, I think we would have to adopt the local law by uh, July 19th. So the public hearing would have to be completed either before then or on that date for um, for a vote uh, by that date. Mm -hmm. The um, the permissive referendum petition deadline, I think, would be in September. Right. Uh, and because then you have 60 days, you know, it has to elapse um, 60 days before the ballot in November. Uh, I guess, in theory, if, if we miss that, we could call a special election for the purpose of voting on um, a proposition. Um, you know, that's a, a whole other thing. Um, you know, one other thing to, to remember is that, you know, the, we are still going to be allowed to pass local laws and regulations governing the time, the place, the manner uh, of the adult use retail dispensers if we were to allow the on-site consumption license, if we were to not opt out, uh, or if the referendum were to go, you know, a, a certain way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they were, if they were ultimately allowed within town. What's so on-site consumption license? Like a cigar bar kind of thing, but you're smoking marijuana. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, Lana bar. So, uh, <laughs> uh, joint bar. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we would be able then to do some type of a local law and maybe put something into our zoning where it could not be. Then we could do a radius from churches or schools or so on and so forth that would cover that so that's why i was saying with john tegeter because he's very good with that to 
let's say we don't want to have a five mile radius from any school or I'm, I'm just using numbers at this point um, or, you know, from churches or the like. Um, so we could do it that way. We could have our own local law that we wouldn't allow dispensaries in those areas. And that kind of excludes where they could go anyway, because it would have to be a commercial area. Oh, but yes. It could have it, to be in the, uh, the O zones, the industrial zones. That's the only place you can be. Right. Now, mm -hmm. I have no problem with medical marijuana use. I, you know, that's yeah. that's totally part, you know, not even part parcel to this discussion. No. That, that uh, um, you know, I understand that that does, does help people that, that, that need it. Right. You, can, you can do that. You have flexibility. You just I think the standard is you can't make the operation of these things unreasonably impracticable by the use of your um, local police powers <laughs> well, hmm. now what that means like to ask is that hmm. all right so this is something uh, you know i'm just trying to get the temperature of the town board and what they're thinking about uh, this particular law and uh, uh how we want to move forward from this point well, Tom, I think, you know, I'm on record already as uh, having the same stance you have, um, you know, and I've heard the, top, the tax dollar argument. Uh, and, you know, Alice, actually, my daughter and your daughter are the same age, went to school mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. and you know what, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't have to look at myself. I'll look at someone like the supervisor with two, two young children yeah. Yeah. And, and say, you know, if I wouldn't want that for my child, I wouldn't want it for theirs and for theirs. that's how i feel and i definitely don't think that uh you know sell, selling out our kids for tax dollars is the way to go no i mean this is adult marijuana usage like buying cigarettes i guess but let's face it i mean we probably all did it as kids i know i never did i never gave anybody you never oh, inhaled oh. right <laughs> no i never <laughs> <laughs> I <like> the <laughs> but I, I never gave anybody money to go buy beer for me. You know, I, I never did that. Um, but I mean, that kind of stuff can happen and, and most likely will. So if we restrict that amount of, of uh, movement, I guess, within the town, it could only be a good thing for our kids. And I've always said our kids are our future. Without them, we don't have anything <laughs> You know, you raise your kids, and and regardless of what religion or whatever we are, you tell your kids about things that will hurt them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, they're not always going to listen, but here, you know, you kind of try to make it a little, make it a little easy for them to kind of to understand, because if they get to see people who, um, are arrested by the police because they've been driving under the influence. Mm -hmm. um, it may make a difference. And, and see, I'm only looking for it to make a difference in one person's life. That's right. Because we can't put a price on that. No, no. And, and I think that it would just, it would, it would, even with the additional tax dollars would, uh, it's just not worth it. It's just not, you know, like I say, we, we'd stop 50% of the traffic coming in here to buy marijuana, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to be just our kids. It's somebody could come from Somers or let's say Somers de decides to opt out. They're coming to Yorktown to buy, you know, so we can say we're not going to have it. We're not going to have it. They won't come. Here. And uh, I, I Vishnu, what do you think, Vishnu? I think, you know, it's a really bad idea to have. A, we are every day worried about the alliance of, uh, you know, for safe kids and bring the, mm -hmm. uh, this is not a very good idea to have it in our community, you know, even the tobacco is a problem. This is worse, you know. Oh my gosh, yes. I agree with you. Okay. I know there may be a lot of people who might disagree with us, but it's okay. Um, they yep. can come to the public hearing and we'll listen. Um, maybe they'll say something that might change our mind, but I'm going to go and on the side of what I want is for my young children. Yep. That's and the answer right. is no. We always err on the way of safety, and I think that's best. What do you think, Matt? it's pretty clear where the board's at so we'll have adam begin drafting and uh we'll take the necessary steps to refer it out so for public hearing uh, july 19th is attainable to be able to meet that deadline right and i think uh i'm going to talk to john tegan or see if he can make us up a map for the local local law where it's not in proximity of schools nursery schools uh, 
houses of worship. You know, I, I, I'm just throwing things out there at this point where, you know, it would be. Um, well, it's one or the other. So it's yeah, that's what, don't do that. Oh, okay. Don't even bother with that at this point. We'll just go with the, with the, with the referendum. Out, then what yep. you're saying is no dispensaries in the town of York now. Right. So you don't have to go through the, the, the labor intensive work with John to figure out five miles from schools or houses of worship or daycare centers or anything else. If you were going to stay in, then that's, that's where you oh, go. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Very good. And yeah. Yeah. We're okay. all good. All right. So Adam will, Adam will start working on that as well as the two stop signs. Right, Adam? <laughs> yes. And the, uh, weight yeah. restriction and yeah. whatever else we got and we'll have them fri I, friday i have my notes <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll have them friday adam Is that what as you know fridays are for other things <clears throat> can't do that friday <laughs> <laughs> hey it worked <laughs> all right so that ends the that concludes the agenda for this evening um i'm not missing uh, i think that were there any resolutions uh, adam that i'm missing yeah it's laberge that's right. There was one that came in late. The resolution. A resolution to authorize the Burge. Hold on one second. Where's my notes? Where'd that one go? It wasn't on the. Uh, it wasn't on the agenda here. I don't think. No, I yes, it is. I'm, yep. the, it I'm on the late one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you want me to read it for you? I got you. It's okay. Okay. Uh, resolved, the supervisor is authorized to execute an agreement with the LaBurge Group in the amount not to exceed $2,000 for the preparation and submission of congressionally directed funding requests for community project funding for the Hallettsville Sewer Extension Project to the United States Senators from New York. So, as, ever, as we all may recall, uh, we authorized LaBurge to put in uh, an application through Congressman Jones's mm -hmm. office. There's a similar program through Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand's office. Uh, and so we've been advised since the Hallis Mill sewer, uh, uh, sewer extension application was in the top 10 and moved to the Appropriations Committee, that it would be a wise move to try to obtain this, a similar status through the Senator's offices. So uh, this uh, grant this will authorize the Burge to prep the grant and submit it by the deadline. How much was that grant for, Matt? Do you recall off the top of your head? Um, not off the top of my head, I can't recall what exactly. Free money. Motion. Free money. Any second. Motion? We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. There's no other no other business before the board. We did no, run we it have back. To go in. back in. We're going to go back into executive session to continue our conversations uh, from from earlier in the meeting, and we will adjourn from executive session. We have a motion for executive. So um, moved. Give the first, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, Yorktown. Good night, Yorktown. Good night. Good night, all.